You are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. Hello and welcome to Cemetery Confessions. On this episode, we're going to be sitting down with Timothy Stevens of Spectagraph Films. Timothy Stevens is a writer, director, and producer who is currently working on a new feature length documentary about the Dallas Goth Club called The Church, which ran for almost 30 years. The film is called Dark Sanctuary, The Story of the Church. And you can find out more about the film at darksanctuarythemovie.com, as well as their Indiegogo, which is currently running right now to try and raise funds to finish the documentary. On this episode, we're going to be talking about horror films and the influence of horror films both on our personal lives as well as the way those stories and aesthetics harmonize with one another we'll of course be talking about the documentary and the interviews that have been conducted around the church so timothy will be sharing some stories about the nature of the club the patrons the artists who have played the church, as well as some ghost stories attached to the building. And speaking of ghost stories, we'll also be getting into the paranormal, into ritual, into discussions of mortality, and the ways that engenders a fascination with the existential and the ontological as it relates to stories of gothic horror and goth itself so there's a lot to cover as always i am your host danny ashes i'm here with my co-host trey timothy why don't we get started by sharing your origin story as it were tell us a little about how you were first introduced to goth culture and what kind of impact that made on you, how that's stayed with you over your life. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think where it all started with me um, in the, this actually, uh, you know, funnily enough, I've never really thought about this until right now, but um, it kind of coincides with my love of cinema and what really started me, you know, with this uh, almost lifelong dream to become a filmmaker um, Mm -hmm. was when, whenever I was, I was either late elementary school or like early middle school. My mom, she, she bought this like grocery store copy of a DVD of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Yeah. Um, Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, as, as a little kid up until that point, I mean, what had had I seen like the Lion King or Toy Story Mm -hmm. or, you know, I mean, just the, the standard fare for, for kids in the Mm nineties and, um, you know, and, and while this was a really terrible copy of of the film, obviously it was (laughs) not criterion collection version. (laughs) No, not by any means. Like I wouldn't even know if it's like standard definition. It was like substandard definition. Um, you know, uh, that being said, you know, I had never seen a film like that, you know, and if, if you haven't seen it, um, you, you definitely should, uh, your listeners, you know, it's a German expressionist film and, you know, these guys were really inspired by Gothic literature, you know, and most of the early German expressionist films were re makes of classic you know gothic literature so you mm-hmm. know nosferatu obviously that was dracula there was another film called the vampire uh, which yeah. was actually based on a uh, a story that predates dracula which is is cool and then of course the cabinet of dr caligari is is somewhat more of an original tale but it's you know the the scenery the set design is very twisted and everything's off kilter and of course it was in black and white but it's really like high contrast black and white and um you know you just get the sense that you're kind of watching like a nightmare unfold for you and um 
You know, it was kind of from that moment where like two things happened. Uh, the first one, I was like, uh, you know, holy shit, movies can be art. Mm. And and that was kind of a awakening moment for me. And then, the, the, you know, the second one was that um, that aesthetic that that film embodies and that a lot of that German expressionist film embodies. And I, I did see Nosferatu pretty quickly after mm. that as well. It, it may have all came in the same like dvd collection that my mom got for like five bucks (laughs) at walmart or something um and you know i and i didn't have a word for it at that point but you know pretty soon i i went out and and read uh dracula and then after that i read frankenstein and after that i read the picture of dorian gray and before before long my uncle um who i i owe a lot to as far as like kind of supporting my my interests. He saw that I was getting into all of this and he gave me his entire very well-worn collection of the Vampire Chronicles. Um, so by the time I was like through middle school, I had read, you know, like Interview with the Vampire and I was moving on to the Vampire Lestat and um, Queen of the Damned. And so you can imagine what kind of effect uh, that was having as... Yeah. I was beginning to kind of develop myself as an artist as well. And, you know, it wasn't until probably late middle school and early high school, I met this kid who was, uh, his name is is Jade. And he was the goth kid in our little (laughs) podunk town of of Texas. And, um, you know, a classic long black hair down to the middle of his Mm -hmm. back wearing trench coats in the summer. And, um, we became best friends and he, uh, started like throwing music my direction. So he was throwing like the Cocteau twins and, uh, oh man, skinny puppy and, uh, 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 Bauhaus. And I mean, just any, anything he was discovering, he was kind of like passing on to me. So needless to say, by the time I, I was in high school, I was pretty much um, as much as you can kind of being sort of disconnected from a scene. I was as goth as you could expect in a little uh, little town, Texas, in the middle of nowhere, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, it was sort of just then when the Internet was really starting to pick up and we could, you know, kind of uh, start connecting with a lot of these things through message boards and uh and that sort of thing um so i sort of like seeped a lot of that culture sort of through the grapevine and and through this friend of mine who was you know um kind of the source of goth in our our little town you know um he introduced me to vampire freaks back in the day yeah (laughs) yeah that was a big I mean, internet, uh, message boards was everywhere. That is funny though, that, uh, it, it all started with the, uh, what would we call that? Not criteria, the, the Walmart auteur collection or something. Yeah. <laughs> the Walmart auteur. Yeah. Uh, yep. That's good. There is such a, an interesting connection there. Obviously, you know, Bauhaus, uh, drew from the doctor, the cab, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari as well. Um, and there's yeah, all kinds yeah. of film connections throughout uh, goth music history. I guess, you know, one of one of the questions I was pondering on around this subject as someone who's a filmmaker in alternative culture is how you kind of link those two things uh, in your own worldview and how they, or if you keep them separated, how they interact with the way you understand the world and yourself uh, uh, and your relationships and, and your creative processes and that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I, I really see them as kind of inextricably linked. You know, I I primarily make horror films, although, uh, you know, Dark Sanctuary is a documentary. It kind of pulls on a lot of, you know, horror aesthetics and, you know, the way we film, you know, like, uh, you know, unfortunately, at this point, uh, 2424 Swiss Avenue, in which the church used to reside, um, is abandoned now just and you can see that in our uh, uh, teaser trailer that we put together. Um, And it naturally lends itself to this kind of like haunted vibe you know um there's really no other way to shoot it like it just film it it looks spooky you know um up until this point um you know my films have been primarily horror or or like supernatural thriller 
in uh, you know those we as as horror filmmakers we owe most of our uh tropes to uh really got gothic literature and um you know and uh, you, you know and more specifically like the victorian ghost mm-hmm. story you know like mr james and you know a lot of um you know susan hill she kind of built on that a little bit later on with um uh, the woman in black and right. uh, mist in the mirror and some of those stories. And, you know, really, um, and then Anne Rice, of course, you know, she's was the queen of, of that whole aesthetic. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, to me, I, I don't see a difference, you know, I treat um, the films that I do in kind of literary sense. If you were to read any of my screenplays, they um, now they're they're written in a format that is appropriate for right. film, so they're not o- overly verbose or anything like that. But they do read in a kind of literary fashion, and to me, all of that goes back to where it all started for me, which you know uh, was first those films, but then um, really I kind of like marathon read just as much like gothic literature as i could which was primarily you know the the classics that everyone Mm. everyone thinks Mm -hmm. of so um yeah i just i i kind of don't see a uh a division or even a line Mm. in in all that it's just kind of the uh it's the the expression of like that kind of uh love i have for the the darkly romantic and um sometimes the horrific you know um and you know, and the cool thing about that is in, in both horror and uh, I also think in, you know, just gothic aesthetics to begin with is that it can embody both beauty and uh, terror mm-hmm. all, in the, all in the same package. Um, and like how many things, you know, you, you can't do uh, romance in terror, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> there's there's very few genres uh, or like modes of expression that can kind of hold all those things in the same. And I, I think that's part of like what attracts a lot of people. It's that kind of like beautiful di- dichotomy of uh, of what goth can be, which is both beautiful and somber and both beautiful and terrible, you know, right. <laughs> all at the mm-hmm. same time, you know. Yeah. Beautiful and terrifying. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, I should have specified horror because I knew we both knew what we were talking about, but people listening might not know what we were talking about. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. that's really interesting. I guess um, for me, and try to be interested to hear what you think as well, because I know you're not a, a big horror movie person. Um, my, mm-hmm. just briefly, my relationship with horror and and goth has kind of changed over the years because earlier in sort of like high school and college i was really into more uh like slashers and monster movies sort of more leaning towards kind of like the gore hound kind of thing so like hellraiser and inside and martyrs um like session nine which isn't really a gore that's like psychological horror but midnight meat train that kind of stuff um and at that point in my life the connection was more uh the willingness of horror to uh and goth to to look at the ugliness in the world and reflect on uh what that does to our minds and our bodies and societies and get us to think about how we should be making change uh which was i in my view more of a simplistic kind of view but it worked for me at the time and in the last few years, I haven't spent that much time watching horror films for various reasons. Um, they've been more few and far between. But the movies that I love that aren't strictly horror are more along the lines of what you've been talking about that still kind of take inspiration from supernatural horror or gothic horror. So the big obvious ones are like Crimson Peak and Only Lovers Left Alive, which are... Mm, um, mm-hmm. um, what i love these days about horror films that things that explore more the existential uh themes so like the the process of becoming and how painful that can be or what it means to have a body or uh the nature of identity and and the anxiety and um 
um, sometimes the, uh, what can be unutterable despair that stems from those experiences or like what happens after death, which gets into like the supernatural, uh, side of that kind of thing. Um, and I think horror provides a medium through which to, um, understand or internalize or excise those experiences which can be unsettling but also healing and i think like you were saying goth culture is situated in a way that explores uh similar subjects but in different ways and also like you said of course there's a shared aesthetic right like the first time i watched interview with the vampire my brain melted and my eyes rolled into the back of my head Oh, I know, uh, right? Yeah, I just wanted all their yeah, clothes. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. <laughs> I still want all I, their clothes. I dressed like a 18th century vampire for the next 12 years. It was so right. transcendent and formative for me. Um, but, and then I also, you know, enjoyed like the trashy 80s horror films, which have that like kitschy VHS October Halloween aesthetic, um, which I, I find a lot of goths have kind of a fondness for as well. But that's for me, that's like where there's kind of a... Um, this synthesis of those two um, aspects of of art, I guess. Yeah, you know, I um, you know, one one way I've I've really in the last um, maybe five years or so really been thinking about horror um, is uh, you know it from the point of view of you know it is a it is a mode of ex- you know artistic expression that allows you to tackle some of those big existential questions like you were talking about you know life after death meaning uh in your life mm-hmm. you know the uh the uh you know impermanence of mm-hmm. relationships mm-hmm. you know um and, and that sort of thing like really really good films that deal with that is like hereditary you oh, know yeah. it's um you know in some ways is asking you to to think about you know the uh um well, I guess, you know, that one specifically is about, you know, inherited trauma. Right. Um, you know, and in the all of these things, you know, like imagine if that went into a Marvel film. Mm. No one would watch it, <laughs> right? Like, uh, or they would, and then they would trash talk it and it would get uh zero on Rotten Tomatoes and no one would see it again, right? But there's something about the conventions of a horror film that makes all of that very palatable. Uh, to people and you know and it can be really fun and it's exciting and it gets your adrenaline going there's like a physical response that people have you know uh, you know that you can like actually see you know if you were to connect someone up to like a whole bunch of monitors Mm -hmm. you would see their emotional and uh, chemical response to horror films Um, so they enjoy these uh, experiences and at the same time you know and and a lot lot of times they're really people aren't like aware that they are being asked these, you know, pretty complicated um, and difficult questions. Right. And, um, you know, and I, I think that's, that's really cool, you know, and not every movie has to be yeah. that way, you yeah. know, like I enjoy films like the evil dead, oh, yeah. you know, but I, I don't think there's much depth and maybe someone wants to argue with me on that, but I, I don't think there's a lot of depth to some horror films like that. And, and that's cool. Right. You just enjoy it. Um, but if you want to put some really some deep thoughts, so to speak, <laughs> into a horror film, you can, mm-hmm. you know, and it may not be for everybody, you know, um, but the uh, the commercial success of horror films is proven, you know, that you can put some heady stuff and people will still go watch it, um, which I I think it's cool. It's, you know, um, it's why, you know, why why become an artist if you don't want to say something, mm, yeah. you know? Um, and that's, that's, uh, you know, what I've come to try to do with the, uh, the work that I, I put yeah. out. Very cool. Uh, Trey, did you have any thoughts you want to throw in or, or no? Yeah. Well, I mean, I just, you, you kind of teed me up there a little bit with, you know, introducing, you know, that, that I have, I guess would be un atypical attitude towards horror and that I'm not a big horror movie fan, which does seem to be a not so common attitude within goth but a lot of that stems from um growing up really in the 80s and the idea of horror as a genre that sort of calcified in my mind is that like you said the sort of gory sl- schlocky slasher type flicks that were so big coming out of the 70s and into the 80s um which i never really gravitated to as much as i do enjoy the nightmare on elm street series but that's mostly because i really love a a good bad pun 
So having it go along with murders are, are, is kind of fun too. But I just, I don't really get off on gore. It doesn't really appeal to me. The special effects are kind of fun and novel, but they don't, they neither thrill me nor interest me. And I'm also, I do have an aversion to seeing people in pain. Yeah. Being afraid is one thing. I don't necessarily have a problem with fear, but seeing people who are being tormented and put in pain needlessly, I don't get any enjoyment out of that. But I do really enjoy a lot of the more psychological thrillers, or, or as you were saying, Danny, with your evolution, when you got into the more quote unquote deep horror movies that are more about those sort of inner states. It's not about the visual spectacle of being eviscerated by some weird deformed beastie, right? It's about that beastie being inside yourself mm-hmm. and tearing apart your very soul, not this sort of body horror kind of oh, thing. Tear your soul apart. Right. So, I mean, some of my touchstones that I've really liked are things like Jacob's Ladder mm. or Misery. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Misery. That, or, that's a, a difficult film to get through. Right. Or The Shining or things like that. Yeah. Aren't really yeah. as straightforward. They're very kind of, they, they just fuck with your head, basically. It's, and they put you in a place where you could think, but by the grace of whatever deity, <laughs> there may go I. Mm. You know, as you as you sort of self introspect and see yourself in some of those situations and and how you could potentially have gone down that path if things were maybe a little bit different or how easy it is for normal people to become monsters mm. um, and I find that to be the really interesting thing that explore that that horror can really explore and I've been really really excited over the last several years of seeing what horror has been doing lately um, and I've been adding movies to the list of things that I want to watch and just haven't got around to it, but things like get out mm. um, and that sort of thing. That's really discussing more the horror of everyday humanity rather than having to put horror and evil in these sort of supernatural, Oh, they're demons. Oh, they're vengeful spirits. It's no hell is other people. Right. So that is what appeals to me more. Uh, sure. So that's generally how yeah, I, I appreciate horror. And I do like the aesthetic of things like the, like you said, the, the tangentially horror things like Crimson Peak, which are not particularly scary, but are just sort of that darkly, gothically beautiful, mm-hmm. that, that decadence that, that you can put in that, you know, it was really a hallmark of a lot of the vampire ones. Mm-hmm. I mean, Only Lovers Left Alive is kind of an apex of taking that idea that was sort of birthed in the Dracula aesthetic where they took what was an old monstrous folktale and turned it around into something a little bit sexual and alluring and decadent. Um, and then it, it just evolves into you know Only Lovers Left Alive a, a later incarnation, which is really all about the torments of that life and the the downfall of that decadence potentially, and the sort of, I guess, melancholy inherent in it, rather than the the fear and horror that it started with, you know, the your dead family members coming alive because you didn't bury them properly and killing townsfolk. <laughs> yeah, that feels very, uh, um, you know, in the vein of Edgar Allan Poe. I think mm-hmm. you know is. The uh, the horror is often, you know, being the only person left alive in, uh, you know, or being alone um, yeah. and, uh, you know, sort of um, in a big house to sort of uh, be wrapped up in your own misery. Yeah. You know, that's um, mm-hmm. I actually mm-hmm. haven't seen that film that you're talking about. So now I have a a, a movie on Which my one? list. I'm going to have to see that. Only. Uh, only oh, yes. My yeah, no, I it is my that. favorite sounds... film. Uh, Jim Jarmusch directed it. And uh, uh, okay, it sounds it's, amazing. Uh, my favorite film, uh, yeah, definitely. Oh, ooh. well, we'll be here another hour if I if I sing its praises, but yeah, definitely check it out. <laughs> it's not a it's not a horror movie, but Sweet. yeah, it's very tangential yeah, yeah, horror. Yeah. It's it's really yeah. only a horror movie because the central characters vampires. are vampires, yeah, yeah. okay, but they're not shown being particularly vampiric. It's a slice of life film, basically. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. But lots of great gothic literature references and um, mm-hmm. very artistically diverse. Anyway, oh, well, let's move on. Let's move on. We'll, we're, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're really going to go off on a, we're never going to come back. Uh, I want to talk about the documentary a little bit here, and then we can maybe talk about some other stuff a little later. 
So cool. yes, the documentary, it's about the church. Let's, well, let, I don't, I don't want to tell people about it. Can you give us a, an overview? What's the project? What is it about? What is the church? Give us, give us kind of uh, an intro to uh, what you're working on here. Yeah, so uh, the title of the film is Dark Sanctuary, the Story of the Church. And um, and this really came about because I honestly, it was during the pandemic and I, I had a newborn and I was really just sitting in front of the TV watching a lot of movies. And um, the the church, the the um, the club had just recently closed and they went under because of you know, the sort of existential pressures that all clubs dealt with because yeah. of the pandemic. And, you know, and we were all sort of as, you know, uh, fans and as like kind of family members, uh, churchgoers, congregants, you know, how, however you want to put this, we were all kind of mourning the loss of the church. And I had, um, I just watched the Studio 54 documentary mm -hmm. um i think it's on Net netflix maybe or amazon but um you know it, it's a really well-made documentary and it's you know the i think studio 54 was around for like four years maybe uh in the 70s and you know after i was done um the first thought i had was like the church was around for almost 30 years um where's the movie about mm. the church why hasn't this been made mm -hmm. and that kind of said at the back of my mind until uh, a friend of mine austin hayes uh he's a, actually the keyboard player for unit code machine which is a, a gothic industrial band um and uh, they're actually out on tour right now and um he had he knew i was a filmmaker um and he uh came to me and basically just said like you need to make a movie about the church and i went holy shit i was thinking the same <laughs> thing um and that's kind of where it where it was kind of the genesis uh, of the project. You know, I'll, I'll circle back and kind of talk about what the church is in a second. But, you know, we um, got a little bit of seed money from uh, from an investor, like just enough to really like get us off the ground. And we went out and started filming on Memorial Day of 2021. Um, and it was really the first, it's just when the club had just reopened in a new location and we just started filming, not really knowing kind of what, what we were doing yet. Um, and, uh, you know, we filmed off and on over the course of the year. Uh, we have about 40 hours of footage that we've shot so far, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually probably it's not that much, like maybe, a, yeah. maybe a third or less than what we actually need to finish the film. Um, so we, uh, thus we, and our funds kind of ran dry and we, we knew that we, we really needed to like take it to the next step where we really started, um, putting some real work behind the film, uh, cause documentaries can be runaway trains if mm. you don't like dedicate yourself to them. I know people have worked on documentaries for 10 years and they're not finished. And, you know, I, I'm don't want that to happen. I want this to, yeah. to be made. So, which is why we started the Indiegogo to start raising funds to get us the rest of the way. Um, but uh, so that, that's kind of like where we're at right now, but you know what the church is and why it's important, you know, Dallas, Texas in the late eighties, early nineties, you know, we had just, come out of the uh the 80s scene where like disco was like um kind of it's on on its way out and like house was on its way in and edm like early edm techno um there was a uh a really famous club which several documentaries have been made about called the start club um that was in dallas and it really was that kind of like glitzy studio 54 vibe um mm -hmm. obviously the music was not uh not quite the same because it was post disco but you know the there was by the time the start club closed there was this extremely fertile ground for alternative culture in dallas mm -hmm. which was really unexpected because it is especially in the eighties was what you would think Dallas is, which is, you know, just big oil money, you know, and, uh, guys that own cattle ranches mm -hmm. and, you know, hot shots doing cocaine, <laughs> um, out of convertibles, uh -huh. you know, um, with big, uh, you know, uh, cow horns on the, on the front. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, 
despite all that, this alternative culture was there and it was punk and it was new wave and it was, um, there, there was a big gay uh, mm-hmm. culture that um, really kind of was like very much fostered by the start club. And, you know, all of this, you know, and there was a vacuum that happened whenever the start club closed and, you know, amidst all of this, uh, there's a club owner and DJ named Don Nedler who had been opening these other clubs in other cities called the lizard lounge with the focus of doing um, kind of uh focusing on the new wave of DJs as being kind of the center of attention. So he was a part of that wave of realizing that, hey, DJs can be rock stars. This is when we were first starting to get DJs like uh, Moby and Paul Oakenfold that, mm. you know, were no longer just there to like kind of create a background music. Like they were sort yeah. of the center of attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so he opened in the early 90s the Lizard Lounge in 2424 Swiss Avenue, which is this beautiful, um, it was an 1880s or 90s trolley car station that turned into like a restaurant or like a grocery store. And then later on, it was a dinner theater. And when it was a dinner theater, they actually added this kind of in the round uh, uh, stage with a mezzanine and this huge um a stained glass window along the back wall and this enormous Baccarat chandelier that uh, hung almost halfway down to the floor, like just this massive uh, thing and, you know, tall ceilings. So when, after that, it turned into a club called the empire. Um, and after that closed, I think it was a strip club um, and they stopped paying their rent. <laughs> and uh, Don got, cause he was looking for a location for the lizard lounge, uh, got word that this place was imminently going to be vacated because they were kicking out the, um, the current tenants. Mm. And he just walked in there and it took his breath away. Yeah. And, you know, it was uh, a couple of years of the lizard lounge really picking up. And I, I think like Paul Oakenfold was like one of their first, touring acts that they brought in um moby was was very early act Mm -hmm. there as well uh the prodigy um (laughs) was a very early act and you know at the same time the the kind of punk scene and like kind of early goth scene was really starting to form in dallas but they only had like one off once a month nights you know in kind of moving places like uh there was a couple of spots but for the most part it was there's really this uh, this whole that this vacuum of gothic culture within Dallas, all these people existed, but they didn't really like have a a meeting place. They didn't mm-hmm. know each other, you know. Um, and it was, I think it was in 1993 or 94. Um, Don visited this um, club in Miami called, um, well, it was called the church. It was, I think it was at club velvet, but they had a Sunday night industry night that was, uh, mostly for people, you know, like, uh, industry, food industry and bar workers, uh, that didn't work on Sundays where they could go blow off steam. And they were, um, I don't think they were trying to be a goth club, but all the music they were playing was like really hard hitting, dark industrial with like a little bit of like eighties, going on in mm. there and you know and they they changed the vibe of the club they would get it really dark and they would light it only in red and <laughs> hang up um you know things around the room to give it the kind of feel of like a cathedral um and uh you know he was just totally inspired by that and by the permission of the club owners he brought that concept to dallas and like little did he know like how suited 2424 Swiss Avenue was for the vibe of a a goth club called the church. Um, Because as I said, it's, you know, tall ceilings, massive floor to ceiling uh, stained glass windows. And it just, you know, it it, it just had had a vibe um, undeniably. And, you know, change all the, the bulbs to red add some smoke, um, you know, throw in, uh, you know, Bella Gossi's dead or like sisters of mercy. Um, I think they used to always open the night with like, um, what's that song by sisters of mercy? Not, not Marianne, the other, uh, the other really popular one. Um, uh, Lucretia, uh, Luc- Lucretia, or... my reflection. That was like very often the first song that they would play as people were coming in the doors. Right, okay. Um, and, uh, you know, it took a while, but, 
within the first couple of months, um, everyone knew that the church was the place. And, um, and it didn't, it didn't take long before, uh, really the church was kind of the Mecca of goth culture and, um, you know, the, the after effect of it and what, what we're really focusing on in the film is that, you know, you had all these people that, um, and, you know, and it was, it was a lot harder. And this is a bit before my time. Cause I was, I was pretty young, you know, in like 93, 94, but, mm-hmm. uh, it was a bit harder at that time, uh, to to be one of us Mm -hmm. yeah yeah you were um you know your parents didn't accept you at school you were thought to be a freak or worse than that dangerous um and you know uh in a lot of a lot of you know people in the goth culture you know um were gay and they uh, they didn't feel like they could come out you know and Mm. uh and even worse, like really in Dallas, like it could be dangerous <laughs> to yeah. come out, you know, um, mm-hmm. we're still having, you know, um, like people getting assaulted in the streets and in downtown Dallas um, because of how they they dress and, you know, what their uh, um, their gender identity is. And, you know, the incredible thing was, is that Don the owner put forward uh, pretty early on a, a phrase that kind of became the marching orders um, in the banner of the church, which was enter without prejudice, um, which meant no matter who you are, like gay, straight, um, uh, drag queen, uh, trans, um, uh, you know, no matter the color of your skin, whether you're religious, not religious, Satanist, atheist, um, you know, big little fat skinny like it just really didn't matter if you wanted to come in in like full gothic victorian or if you wanted to come in with like duct tape over your nipples and a uh a diaper made of tin foil like whatever you know um Mm -hmm. and but the the real world effect of that was is that um the people um started to really embody that uh tenant and before long, you had this massive uh, community of people that embraced you for who you were, no matter what. Um, unless, unless you're, you know, they they did kick out uh, some like uh, skinheads at various times. So like it only goes so far, right? But, yeah. Um, yeah. Hate, <laughs> you know, it yeah. doesn't doesn't fit in there. Um, but but it does cross political persuasion. You know, there are people that you know are definitely um you know on the right side of the political spectrum and the left side of the political spectrum that you know have this commonality of like i love you for you Mm -hmm. which is which is incredible and this was happening 30 years ago you know uh near Mm -hmm. nearly and it had a transformative effect on uh on dallas and that is that's really the story that we're trying to tell and you know apart from that there's just some really crazy things that that happened at the church like uh oh, sure marilyn manson hung out there once uh because deed of on Tees was performing and they were a thing at the time um mm. the cure came in and played pool um <laughs> Yeah, which is a really funny thing to think about. Uh, one time, uh, Trent Reznor dropped in uh, unexpectedly and just hung out and like talked to everybody and like signed the wall. Um, hmm. uh, I, and there's some really, and maybe you know, I, I uh, maybe we can talk about later. But there's some really funny stories that happened and like just really wild things. But then there's also a um, pretty well established belief that. 2424 is haunted and a considerable amount of evidence to support that. In fact, I have some really wild stories that I've been told about what people have seen and experienced. And I actually just interesting today, someone sent me a photo of what appears to be a, uh, apparition. And, oh, really? Yeah. And cause I, I've been, I, I knew about this and I've been searching for like evidence, you know, like the stories are interesting, but you know, like show me a photo or something, give me an EVP. And, and I got one, someone just like sent it to me because they were like in the picture dancing and they thought they looked cute. And I like looked in the background. I was like, what is that? And they were like, Oh, I don't know. Like there's no smoking in the club and the smoke machines weren't on. So what is that? So this was while it was still a club too. This was a Correct. scene yeah. in the club 
live people dancing and just in the background there's uh, the ghost of Bella Lugosi. Yeah. Oh, it could have been undead, undead, undead. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so much to explore there, you know, from the famous people that played there, the bands that played there. I mean, like, you know, VNV Nation, Clan of Zymox, um, the, uh, uh, you know, Skinny Puppy, um, you know, there's the biggest names in Gothic industrial music have played there. Yeah. Um in addition to like these insanely famous people like within you know like celebrities within the culture just kind of hanging out and you know not to mention really to me the most important thing is that kind of story that i mentioned of this kind of transformative attitude of like kind of radical acceptance like whoever you are like we love you um yeah i don't know it's like all of that combined it's like uh why hasn't there been a movie made of this yet i guess i have to do it yeah. you know <laughs> As Thanos would say, fine, I'll do it myself. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting. Well, and yes, we, I do want to come back to some of the stories and I want to ask you about kind of maybe your own experience. But since you were kind of talking about how much there is that's happened there, I was interested from a production side of things because the, the landscape of documentaries on goths and i don't think there is a dearth of documentaries about goths or goth clubs but the 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 number of uh quality uh good documentaries are not so many for those that are have been around for a while maybe the the younger listeners don't know about this but people were very wary of anyone making a documentary and not not i'm not speaking about you but just as a backdrop of the, the what has been done before um there are some pretty poorly handled or even um sort of like the jerry springer angle of of things of sort of the, oh, sure. uh, yeah, the yeah. outsider exploitation uh kind of thing when when making sort of some full-length documentaries but also stuff filmed for like news channels um that kind of thing like little I don't know what you would call those like mini documentaries they do for the old news packages. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering from a sort of uh, from a creative perspective, considering the fact that you have all of this material, you have all these different um, narrative avenues you can pursue, you know, documentaries aren't just sort of these uh, stoic um I guess, unbiased, like things that exist uh, uh, objectively outside of the world there, you know, you have uh, 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 particular themes you'd like to explore it to some degree. What's your kind of um, ethos going into the film and um, your, your, I guess, your goal, your motivation? How do you or how do you kind of wrangle all of these uh uh, interviews into something that's cohesive over <laughs> 60 or 90 minutes, you know, that seems really daunting. It is daunting. Um, and it's something that changes, you know, week to week and sometimes mm. day to day because, you know, where I'm constantly, especially right now, we put out the Indiegogo. Uh, we had a big launch party on uh, this past Sunday uh, yeah. at the church. And, you know, all the, all the uh, you know, the original members that went back in the early 90s and then everybody that's new, they all, if they didn't know about the, documentary they know about now um mm -hmm. and they're all you know lighting up my uh messen messenger on facebook and telling me all kinds of new stuff so right you know so the um this uh the story is kind of being shaped as we go but we you know i always go into a film no matter whether it's scripted especially if it's scripted but even documentaries with kind of a really broad view of uh, kind of an outline of where I think the story is going. Um, and, uh, you know, for us is, you know, I was really inspired by the film. I think it's called Until the Light Takes Us. Um, it's the oh, film yeah. about the uh, black metal scene yeah. in the early 90s. And um, what that film does really well is that they, and I always forget the name of this dude, but the, there's basically, I mean, there's kind of like one guy that survived that scene all the rest of them either died or uh like varg vikernas ended up going into prison yeah. mm -hmm. and you know they make that guy the protagonist of the film 
and it, you know they t- while telling the history of you know the all those events that that happened but you kind of see this guy like in in the current moment um doing what he's he's doing trying to be a, a record label owner and owning a record store and all this um so we're we're taking a similar approach where um Joe Virus, who was uh, and is the main room DJ for the church and has been for nearly the entire life of the club, um, he's our he's our protagonist. So we're gonna um, we're gonna follow him in his journey from being a uh, a little goth kid in Georgia, moving to Dallas, uh, discovering mm. Skinny Puppy, becoming enamored with Deep Ellum and the music scene in Dallas, and then deciding one day I'm going to be the main room DJ in the club. Uh, it's, it's my thing. That's what I'm going to do. So we're going to follow that journey really from then until now. Um, and, you know, and that's, I think that's important. We all need somebody to root for. And, you know, yeah. Joe is one of the coolest people I've ever met. Um, he's somebody that's very easy to, uh, to root for and, and want to uh, see succeed. And he is still, you know, after like nearly 30 years of being a, um, a DJ at a club and actually he was a DJ before then, you know, he's still chasing his dreams and like achieving like next level shit. Like it's, it's really cool to watch. And, uh, you know, but it kind of go back to your other question is, um, you know, documentaries by their nature are, uh, they are kind of pretending to be objective while being completely subjective. And that's just mm-hmm. like, you you can't really make a yeah we'd have to get a robot to make a documentary if we wanted it to be objective um and, and no one would watch it and no one would <laughs> watch it yeah it'd be really you watch boring. it for the subjective nature it's it's the curation that is yeah. the subjective aspect that makes documentary so interesting yeah 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 and you know the the thing is is that you know i uh, when i moved to dallas from my little podunk town that i grew up in um which which is not so podunk anymore. It's gotten better. But when I was there, it was a little podunk. Um, one of the first places I discovered was the church. And um, uh, that was over 10 years ago, nearly 15 years ago. And and I became a regular at the church as, as much as I could going to college and working and all that. And, uh, and I, I was, I was goth before I started going. Um, I was definitely like kind of opened my eyes a lot and I got to really absorb like a lot of stuff from everyone <laughs> because of just the sheer amount of people, you know, they were seeing a thousand people a Sunday, um, at, uh, uh at the church, um, which is crazy. That's a, yeah, that is crazy. Yeah. It's a mm-hmm. lot, you know, and that, that would be like a normal night. So, you know, you can imagine just the, uh, the sights and the, and the sounds and, um, and the experience of, of all of that. But, you know, uh, kind of getting back to the point I was making is that this is a pretty subjective uh, approach that I'm going to take to this because a lot of these people are my friends. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I haven't because I had a kid and, you know, I'm making, making films as a, a pretty you know, more than full-time gig. So, you know, I, there's a space of time where I wasn't going to the church as often as I used to. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I feel like hopefully positioned in, in a way that I can kind of, um, I can look at this from an inside point of view, but also because I only experienced like maybe less than a third of the life of the whole club. Mm. Uh, there's a little bit of an outsider point of view too, where I can like, kind of look at this and like find you know uh uh, sort of things to be fascinated by which which is what i love to do with anything i'm researching is like i love to get obsessed and and fascinated um and it's very easy to be obsessed and fascinated with the history of this incredible uh club you know um so you know i i don't know i mean i don't think it's in me to be exploitative um because i would sort of have to be like exploiting myself in a way yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think there will be an element where I, I do want this to reach out beyond 
viewers that are strictly within that kind of subgenre of goth. Yeah. You know, I think that's important just for the success of the film yeah. that, you know, part of the film may be dedicated to like explaining what goth is which can mm. be like a pretty like touchy and um, mm. like, I, you know, for example, like, <laughs> you we, don't have to tell me that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm sure you know, like, um, you know, and I, we may not do as much of that as I had originally thought from the get go, but like, I, uh, to give an example, we interviewed Aurelio uh, Voltaire, mm-hmm. which you may know him. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, one of his favorite places to play was the church um, just for the people and also just the incredible performance space and we interviewed him for the film and i asked him that question what is goth and he he uh he stopped and kind of looked at me took a sip of his bottle of rum that he always has and goes did you really just ask me that question (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know so it is um you know, it, we're I, we're gonna have to toe the line of like I think a lot of people really know what goth is. It's not like what it used to be, where you know, like there was a huge misunderstanding about what to be goth meant. You know, it's it's a little bit more understood now. So I don't think we'll have to do as much of that. But but I I don't know. Have you visited many comment sections on anything about what goth is? <laughs> Maybe lately? I haven't. No. <laughs> <laughs> um but you know there is no one definition either so uh to, right. to be able to sum that up and i think that's where voltaire was coming in was like how do you answer that question yeah you know it's yeah in a sound bite uh, i mean it's he, everything he has. you know he, oh, i'm he sure wrote he has a book yeah. called what is goth i think oh that's yeah. right and yeah, I, yeah yeah and he's got yeah. recorded sound bites as well on yeah. various things from a while ago but yeah. he's maybe backed away from some of that or decided that it was too pat an answer and it is more nuanced yeah Oh yeah, yeah, and um, and I I don't think that's really the point of the documentary anyway, you know. No. Um, and and I would say like a fair amount of people that started coming to the church weren't necessarily goth, you know. There was punks, there was new way yeah. waivers in the early days. Um, you know, the BDSM scene started to kind of like coexist mm-hmm. in this this crowd as well, and a lot of them like they just want to have an opportunity to wear all of their paraphernalia and accoutrements and, you know, uh, you know, PVC and, uh, vinyl and all that. Um, Mm -hmm. and, uh, outside, uh, you know, to be able to do that in like a club setting and really in Dallas, like most clubs, you would get kicked out (laughs) dressed like that in the club, you know, in the church, they just, they didn't care. You know, that was, that was great almost argue that just watching the documentary is in in and of itself an answer to that question not the answer but an answer to what is goth at least at this time at this place right yeah all this space what we're presenting here is goth this is what it was Mm -hmm. well i mean yeah that's i I think part of the problem with some documentaries i've watched is and and this is just completely my opinion because it speaks to what I like and different people like different things, obviously. But I, you know, I like the sort of situating the story and like you, what you were saying, sort of grounding it as the, this is uh, uh, the story of these people and, and over this period of time in this place, rather than what some, some documentaries try to do is extrapolate to goth everywhere and have too mm-hmm. wide of a scope and right. and and then you're trying to say trying to speak to people uh, at least across america or across the uk or wherever um when really you have this contained um uh diverse already very diverse and dynamic group of people uh that are experiencing this thing in their own way that are making it their own unique uh, complex experience and and i think sometimes people try to go too grand with that uh in some of the in some documentaries and uh i think it it muddies it a little bit Mm -hmm. and again this is just to some i'm not talking about you i'm talking about other things i've seen but i definitely really like i've i loved the trailer that i saw i love the indiegogo page it looks fantastic i love the the fact that you have been to to the church and are you said you're friends with the people that have gone there and and that uh there's an integrity and clearly a passion to the project as i can hear as you're talking about this because you know again some of the frustrations i've had with other things that i've watched is there there's this clear sort of well let's let's just 
get a bunch of footage of people doing like blood play and suspension because that's <laughs> shocking well, there, and that's what people that, want to see you know that will right. be a piece of it but um yeah it's a, right. it's a nature it's a nature documentary right. as a glorified yeah, yeah. cultural analysis see the lions as it stops its prey through the savannas and yeah see see the yeah. goth is as she uh is uh uh, as hooks shoved through her back and is raised on the ceiling and she bleeds upon her uh yeah. her partner blower <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, that exists yeah for sure and it actually you know i i've just recently learned just how much of of that was really like supported within you know the suspensions and everything within uh um the church because that was a bit before my time when all that started but torture garden uh one of the biggest mm. national and international um you know they they do suspensions and all all yeah, kinds of yeah, stuff sounds, like that yeah. um one of their biggest you know uh shows every year um and still is is when they partner with the fetish ball which is the huge bdsm fetish event that happens every year at the church um mm. and uh and yeah torture garden became uh, a really big part of that um and we're just we're just now kind of you know i have had a chance to interview a lot of those people yet um i'll be honest that that starts to get like a little beyond my understanding of like why would you want to do that um but i'm interested to find out why people want to do that yeah. you know mm -hmm. Yeah, because clearly it's um, I mean, there's something to watching it. It's it's a spectacle. But I want to know, like, I want to talk to the people that actually do that yeah. and understand like what motivates them to to do that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, very fascinating. Yeah, it's not my thing either, necessarily. I think sometimes uh, you can get the sort of voiceovers that are, make it this sort of forced uh, this is goth, whereas like you don't need that. You, it's like here are people doing this thing, um, and let them tell you what they're doing. Let them tell you what it is. You know. And yeah, so, I mean, I really see this film as being kind of like a massive character study, whereas like a biopic might be a character study on an individual. This is kind of a character study on dozens of people. Um, mm. And I, you know, I'm playing around with kind of some ideas of how I want to do that. And, you know, working idea I have right now is actually to do little like almost like mini featurettes within the documentary where we meet somebody and then we get to see all the shit that they're into um, and almost like uh, get a sense of like what makes this person tick, you know, okay, they uh, um, they're into suspensions. Let's see them do it. Let's talk about it. Why, why do they want to do it? And then let's pull it back to the church and, you know, how that wraps in. Um, or maybe, you know, there's a lot of people that do like the uh, kind of Mad Max Wasteland Weekend stuff. And, you know, beneath all that, all these people are creators. They are fabricators. Yeah. They're yeah. three-dimensional artists, you know, in... Um, you know, I, I would love to to do little featurettes on that and kind of see them making all of this stuff and have them talk about why they're passionate about that and then tie it into the church. And, you know, because I, I think like in our in our log line, in our kind of one line description of the film, you know, we talk about uh, makers, misfits and artists. And I think that kind of like sums up like what the church is like everyone there. This is probably probably true in other places as well but you know everyone there is a creator of some sort mm -hmm. it may it may be in some actual like art forms um it could just be that they're the creator of their own persona you know mm -hmm. um they're able to be as uh, joe virus puts in the uh uh the trailer their super selves um mm. you can be lestat you know, if, if you yeah. want to at the church, um, you can be blade. Um, you can, uh, you can be but no crows allowed. Uh, okay. Well, there's, yeah, there, <laughs> no, there no, are crow just, lookalikes. Um, there almost always are. That's, yeah. that's yeah. the trope, right? Neo, is you know, way too many people who go as the crow yeah. to their, their first goth. Yeah. Night. Um, and I, and I think that's cool. You know, um, I really, I really dig that um yeah and it's you know and, and i do it too when i i go to the club i i go to the the church in full like gothic victorian um because where else can i do that right i mean i guess i kind of do it at work 
you know, um, but there's only so much I can get away with that. I can't wear a top hat to work, you know, mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> as much as I would love to. Well, victims, aren't we all? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so I mean, I don't know how much you can or want to share, but if you if there are uh, you kind of teased it earlier, if there are stories that came out in these interviews uh that were interesting some kind of juicy details that came up uh that you you feel like you can share ahead of the actual film coming out uh yeah yeah that i would love to hear anything you want to share with us (laughs) yeah let me think about that there are there are some things that i'm still questioning like do we put this in the documentary or not you know um i i will say for the most part, and I would say overall, like it's a very chill crowd at the church. Hmm. But at one point in the early 90s, and I, I don't know when this was, I don't know who these people were, there was, uh, they had a smoking area that was like outside, like a, a porch. And it's where all the hmm. uh, vampire, the masquerade uh, oh, excellent. Uh, people hung out, you know, and they really didn't come in to dance. They just went out there and they did their, their oh, RP, RPG yeah, yeah. stuff, have, you know, <laughs> they have kingdoms to run. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, but it was also where everybody went to smoke for the most part, even though in the nineties you could smoke inside yeah. if you wanted to, um, there, there was an altercation that happened between a, a, a girl and a guy. And I think they were maybe in a relationship and um she broke a beer bottle and then cut his throat um <laughs> out for on real? the porch not, for real this is not like LARPing? no okay. no this has nothing wow. to do with the vampire masqueraders these okay, were like so they're not just gang rules being gang no you know this was <laughs> <laughs> this was some i mean honestly like you know um people just end up coming to the club. I, I, right, I like to yeah. imagine these people were not the normal yeah. club goers because that doesn't represent anybody I've ever met at the church. Um, um, but, um, but this happened and, you know, I think it was somewhat superficial, but you know, he was probably pretty intoxicated and yeah. um, he, he ran inside and uh, blood is trickling after him. It's all over the dance floor. And, um, uh, one of the DJs uh, actually stopped the music and uh, goes, Hey, uh, vampire masqueraders. Uh, we got clean up on aisle nine. We're going to need you oh to come in. Here. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, anyway, that's, that's a really wild story. And it turned out the guy was fine. Like, like I said, I, it, uh, it was not like a, uh, a critical wound that he, he had, um, but it just, I don't think that's representative at all of like the normal, vibe of the church but it's just one of those things like where else does that happen you know like yeah um, and of course all the vampire masqueraders were like fuck you we're not gonna do that <laughs> you know <laughs> shut up we're not um quit picking on us <laughs> um and uh, uh anyway so that that's uh, a funny story that i i think i i'm pretty sure it's gonna it will make it into the documentary and we're, we're playing around with the idea of like um a lot of this stuff we don't have like any video or a photo to support um and we we've actually uh we've hired um this really brilliant artist named ashley thorpe um who was the animator for the uh shutter exclusive film woodlands dark and days bewitched um i believe he also did another severn film uh days of halloween i think um Mm. And uh, which has a lot of really cool animations, but um, he hand draws all this stuff and it kind of has almost like a animated illustration look to it um, to where it's not like very fluid animation. Like it almost feels like um, watching a a painting move or a flip book style almost. Yeah, kind of. I mean, it, it's very reminiscent of like, um, like the animations in Monty Python, you know, where you had like mm-hmm. photos that kind of like animated a little bit, except yeah. all of his stuff is very like spooky and uh, kind of trippy. Um, so we, we've uh, we've talked to him and he's agreed to come on um, and we're going to illustrate some of these stories like the one I just told you using animations. Um, so you you can imagine all of that playing out in this kind of almost like punk style collage you know with like the cutout um sort of uh kind of like the early like suzy sue uh posters um 
and uh, and kind of like what we're em- emulating in some of the uh, graphics that we have right now. But mm-hmm. yeah, and there will be other moments like you know we have no evidence of Marilyn Man- like physical photographs of Marilyn Manson coming to the club, so you can imagine a animation of Manson, you know, like kind of lurking in a corner, sipping absinthe or, or something, mm-hmm. whatever he does. Um, Assault women. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We I thought about wanting to <laughs> interview him, but I I think. Yeah, um, he's not the person that we all thought he was. Um, yeah. So that may not, that probably won't happen. But, but it's interesting that he came there, you know. Um, yeah. And and really, I mean, actually, w- I mean, it, it, in the '90s, it was like it, he, whether we like it or not, he was part of goth, the goth scene. <sighs> yeah, you know? yeah, for sure. But you know, I mean, honestly, one of my like dream interviews, and we're pushing really hard to make this happen, and maybe. I can cast this out in the, into the world, but if anyone has a contact for Adida Von Tees, um, please mm. send her my way or connect me because um, she performed there multiple times um, in the, in the nineties and early two thousands. Oh, really? Um, multiple and, uh, times. which is why, why Manson came because they were, right. uh, they were a thing and um, she was performing. So he kind of slipped in with his entourage, you know, but uh, but I really want to interview her because she, you know, is, um, her perspective performing, you know, her her just, you know, really cool acts that she does um, in such a really interesting space, I, I think would be a, a really interesting perspective to hear, um, mm-hmm. you know, because she plays enormous stages now. And um, this was a very intimate uh, setting, a very beautiful setting, but a very intimate setting. I would love to kind of get her her thoughts on that so so yeah uh, send her my way if maybe dita's <laughs> listening right now um you know yeah i'm, hit, I'm hit, sure hit me up. <laughs> i'm sure she is yeah yeah get, we'll get right on that all right <laughs> uh i uh well let me i i do want to ask because you were on a friend of mine's podcast called the big seance yeah so I would be remiss if I didn't at least ask one paranormal related question and it's, it's tangential. And I mean, I don't need to justify it. This is my podcast, yeah. but, uh, um, <laughs> you know, we, it is a goth podcast, so we do talk about death often enough. So, uh, the way I wanted to frame this question is to sort of ask as someone who has an interest in the paranormal, how that informs and this is a completely i have no good segue to this question i just okay. wanted to ask the question but how that kind of informs your own thinking about uh mortality and uh and the inevitability of death oh god that's heavy yeah it is i know we're we're going <laughs> i'm going right and for it. and a quick left turn yeah yeah well i mean i i will say like i said that the church in my opinion is definitely haunted um We'll tell some really interesting stories about um, like shadows that were seen in this one apparition of a uh, of a boy going up and down the grand staircase and tripping and then disappearing in front of people's eyes. Oh, wow. um, and uh, oh, there was one night when they they couldn't lock the club up because um, alarms kept getting set off from motion inside the club, and uh, and they heard knocking hmm. from the inside after they had locked the door. So they thought they locked somebody in the club. So they opened mm. up the place uh, using the only door that, you know, um, like the one entrance and went around and they couldn't find anyone at all. You know, so there's all kinds of, of stuff like that. But, um, you know, from uh, I, I think, you know, um, so, you know, I grew up a uh, conservative Christian because that's that's what you do in uh, yeah. Texas, yeah. you know. And, uh, you know, there's there's good things and bad things about that. I, I think, you know, the bad thing is, is that you get kind of told that there's only one way to think about uh, spirituality. You know, um, the good thing is, is that you're asked to think about spiritual topics. And I think that is um, uh, can be a segue into thinking about some of these things that, that you just just mentioned. Um and you know uh, while that doesn't really reflect my worldview anymore i do believe that you know um this isn't it you know um and i i don't know what uh the other part is 
per se. Um, but but I'm deeply fascinated by the uh, the people and the um, uh, you know the study of what that it could be you know like spiritualism um and uh parapsychology and um Mm -hmm. uh and you know and also you know like more recently and this kind of stem from a a script that i I, i've written that is unfortunately very expensive to make and is going to be hopefully the next thing i make but it's going to take like a lot of fundraising to get there from you know, like private investment and that sort of thing, like no, no crowdfunding for this, but something that I've become really interested in more lately is um, like occult and um, like Western in somewhat Eastern, but a lot of like Western esoterica, you know, ritual magic and, mm. and stuff like that. And to me, you know, all of these people are kind of off doing their own thing and you have the, um, you know, the ghost people over here and you have the people that are into UFOs over here and <laughs> The ritual magicians off, you know, mm. uh, summoning Astroth, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and and they're all kind of doing their own thing, but they're really all saying the same thing, which is that this isn't it. You know, this what's in front of mm. us is not all of it. And, you know, there, there's interesting individuals like um, kind of in the, the near the near past and also currently like uh, John Keel, for example, who wrote the Mothman prophecies that um, he uh, was doing a lot of kind of journalistic study of phenomena, which started mostly with kind of the UFO stuff. But as he started to do more, and especially when he got involved with the Mothman and the collapse of the uh, uh, Point Pleasant bridge, what he started to see is that it's not so black and white in that, you know, when you have UFO sightings, you also have ghost sightings. When you have UFO sightings, you also have, uh, you know, telekinesis happening in Poltergeist um, and Mm. uh, cryptids all showing up and ghosts and, you know, all this stuff, like, he started to realize that uh, they are kind of all the same thing. Um, what that is exactly, you know, he, he couldn't put his, his finger on. And, you know, like more recently, like, I, I don't know if you've watched uh, Hellier series with Greg and Dana Newkirk. No. Um, oh, God, it's so good. It's on it's on YouTube, but it's if you want to watch with okay. commercials, it's on Amazon. But um, I'll look it up. They they started their documentary series looking for goblins out in Appalachia, um, and they ended it by reading uh, secret codes sent by euphonauts using um, <laughs> like uh, 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 Alistair Crowley based numerology um, to oh, okay. summon the god Pan, right. Um, to bring about, uh, you know, radical change in like, I mean, like it's between two seasons that you, you can, it feels like kind of disorienting to think about like the, the jump. <laughs> yeah. There. That's quite a shift. Yeah. Kinda like um, the two questions I shifted from earlier, but yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but, but, but I'm, I'm starting to really, I mean, on a personal level, like I, I'm just all fascinated by this, you yeah. know, and it makes a lot of really great stories, which I've turned into screenplays and feature films and all that. Um, Mm. but you know, on on a deeper level, like I, I feel like, um, I don't know if we can get an answer out of any of these things, but it does point to me that there is something, um, something more. And if there's something more then to me, it, it makes, um, and I don't know, you could argue this from a humanist perspective that there is nothing more than, you know, uh, than humanism is really important in that situation as well. But I, I just feel like it gives so much more gravity to life and the importance of like what we do to ourselves and to each other and how we care for each other. And, um, you know, I, I feel like it, it supports all of this um, in a way. And that, that starts to get very, foggy and kind of like blurry and hard to like put my finger on but the general notion that i get um like for example like most people that have had um direct encounters with aliens or things that they thought were aliens um the 
telepathic messages that a lot of them are getting is you're fucking up the planet stop mm. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. and that's really interesting that um that that's the message we're getting so it's kind of like the paranormal is like telling us like you need to pay attention and start thinking less about yourself and more about each other in the world you know and well, i I'm, think yeah, i'm all for anything giving that message that's yeah sure. and and that's that's really that's really interesting and i i think it's something john keel noted as well um and it, you know i think it's like when i've talked to like occult practitioners you know in all mm-hmm. genres and wicca and you know um you know, more like the Satanism and like Crowleyan based mm-hmm. uh, stuff. Um, you know, they're all kind of saying the same thing, which is that uh, after they've kind of done their thing and they've come back from the abyss, wherever that is for them, the message is I need to be a better person, which is great. Right. Mm. So that that's kind of and where that fits in with mortality. I don't know. You know, it's kind of like you uh uh we're all developing in in this life um and it it has tangible effects you know both like physical and and spiritual in my yeah. opinion you know yeah i think the developing is is where i'm more currently interested in rather than the sort of finding the answer whether that's mm-hmm. is through a whatever supernatural route you want to take or atheistic route you want to take um because that either way it seems more of a empirical uh epistemic um Mm. sort of like finding what is the root cause i'm less interested in the the what is the ultimate answer to the thing but the 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 process of you know, finding meaning. I think the process is the meaning rather than. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. It's sort of like, um, uh, you know, the uh, the point of the ritual is the ritual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, um, like uh, you know, one thing that I I've found really fascinating that I haven't yet found a way to like work into a screenplay or anything, but is. Um, you know, in, in Pompeii, one of the villas they uncovered was, uh, it's come to be known as the Villa of Mysteries. Um, and it was a uh, kind of a, a training ground for people that were being initiated into a, a cult. Um, mm. And as, as part of that, they had this one room that um, has all these frescoes and it kind of goes and I can't remember if it's clockwise or I think it's counterclockwise. Um, um this journey of someone um essentially kind of descending into hell uh being harried by these um kind of like uh goat people and uh pan is there and then you know they and the, it's young maidens and they kind of come out the other side um and wearing these clean white robes and celebrating in kind of this ecstatic, you know, uh, sort of sort of fashion. But, you know, what it pointed to is that there's this idea of uh, a harrowing um, and mm. going through a harrowing uh, ritualistically so that you can kind of divest yourself of your old body your old self um you go through hell metaphorically and come out you know a changed person with a a new perspective um and i i kind of view ritual that way Hmm. um whether it's magic or whether it's religious or it could be um it could be anything we all have rituals we do all the time um and i kind of almost see like movies that way too is like Hmm. a a good movie can be especially yeah. a horror film can be a harrowing yeah you know and it's something to where like you you kind of come out the other end um with a can potentially come out the other end with a changed perspective and you know and i think that's inherent in storytelling too you know like uh storytelling in in a way is you know that kind of like uh classic you know uh hero's journey into hell uh narrative but um but i think it connects on like a a really deep level you know and when you start to think about like why does every culture in the world have rituals 
why do people that uh, even even people that claim to be atheists still have like they still have rituals <laughs> that they 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 go through you know and uh um in life would be totally color colorless without these things too so um, oh I, yeah i agree with that so um but yeah so i mean honestly, honestly i could talk about that for a long long time uh but well, don't get me down the ritual magic uh route mm. i could i could tell you all kinds of uh crazy things that i've you know well, uh d- dove too deep into <laughs> That, that is, I, I've I've been uh, thinking about uh, doing a a, a a separate podcast episode on a similar theme, so maybe we'll work something out in the future. Oh, um, sure, so yeah. Before we close up here, the two uh, questions I've been asking uh, everyone we have on this year to get this sort of uh, broad picture of opinions on this uh, subject are kind of uh, uh, a pair of. Um, uh, uh, twin questions, I guess. And you can answer this however you want. And the first question is, what are you most excited about for goth right now or with goth right now? And the second question is, what are you most concerned about or what would you change about goth right now? Mm. That, that uh, second one, that's a difficult one. But, um, you know, on the first one, I, I think, I mean, the... Goth continues to change, you know, and and I feel mm-hmm. like we've kind of been in a like slump for the last decade or so, you know, like um, I, I count like kind of the emo phenomena into like kind of the the gothic sphere, you know, and that was that was really big when I was you know in uh, in high school and shortly afterwards. Yeah. And we had bands like My Chemical Romance and like Panic at the Disco and um, Alisana, uh, which Alisana is still oh, uh, pretty big. Oh, yeah. man, they're so good. Um, that we're really carrying forth that kind of banner in different ways. And we kind of lost that for a bit and got sidetracked um, culturally with other things. You know, the uh, there's a, a new wave of young artists that are bringing their own spin on it. And some of it's kind of nostalgic, you know, um, and some of it's like, just like, you know, uh, cutting edge, you know, that um, there's bands like Creeper that uh, are doing some really like cool shit. And um, one of my personal favorites, they're actually local to DFW, is uh, Rose Garden Funeral Party. Um, and she, yeah, I just saw them uh, last month. Thank you. Oh shit! Yeah, Leah uh, Lane is a, a friend of mine, and um, and she actually contributed a song to my uh, previous film, which is called The Ghost Lights. It's actually coming out this year. We don't have a release date yet, but mm-hmm. um, it's a narrative uh, horror film. But um, anyway, you know, she has this voice that is very evocative of singers like Susie Sue, um, and you know, it's really like gloomy, fast-paced death rock with you yeah. know um yeah, yeah how, how to explain what what she does but um you know that's i mean that's what i'm most excited about it it tends to be kind of on the music front you know um and yeah. you know but also just the availability of like gothic clothing you know and that sort mm. of thing you know like uh rebels market and you know it's varying bits of quality on all those things but um you know there's um i've seen like uh, just going to the church nowadays like you see such an incredible diversity in like what people are wearing you know like Mm -hmm. i I met a guy that was dressed like head to toe like uh lestat out of um Mm -hmm. the 18th century you know and i'm just like i couldn't get those clothes 10 years ago (laughs) Mm. you know like i wouldn't have known where to look i would have had to have had a a costume maker or a tailor make these things you know um i did i I had to order mine from like germany so oh yeah yeah Yeah. or do that you know (laughs) (laughs) um so yeah that's that's definitely what i'm most excited about you know i don't know i I don't want to hate on anything in gothic culture you know i mean i i think there is you know uh and this this is a little trite and i don't think it's as real like the internet makes things seem more real than they actually are but you know there's this kind of like 
uh, Instagram goth aesthetic, you know, um, where uh, I, I tend to feel like there, there are people that um, are just kind of like doing stuff for clicks and that's, and I, but how do you verify those things? I don't know any of these people, you know, they're, they're putting forth a personality that I can only view through a tiny square on Instagram. Right. So, right. Uh, yeah. you know, so I, I guess I, I don't want to judge anybody, you know, um, but I think there's a tendency of like, uh, you know, goss of a certain like, uh, era to kind of look at the new stuff and say, Oh, they're not doing it right. You know, right. God, yeah. God damn it. <laughs> you yeah. know, and, um, which is so, you know, like what our parents did to us, you know, like, well, back in my day, this mm-hmm. is how we did things. Um, and, you know, so I, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I'm, so I, yeah, I'm definitely more excited to just see how things are going. I like that, like, Honestly, a lot, some of my favorite shit is like the kind of uh, alternative religion, you know, stuff like Wicca and, um, uh, you know, a lot of like the uh, pagan uh, r- religions kind of finding uh, in spiritualities, finding their way into Gothic culture and combining, you know, with uh, um, style and aesthetic. You know, I, I mean, mm-hmm. I think that's that's pretty, pretty cool yeah um, and i just like i i'm obsessed with all things like pagan you know historically and even modern like i just i just love and am deeply fascinated by all of those things so when they oh, when they bridge over into like goth gothic aesthetic it's kind of like candy yeah <laughs> you know? i'm just like yes give me more please give me more w- witches more witches yeah. Oh, well, we uh, we got to talk about that at some point, I think. Yeah, I will. Because that's going to take too long now. I will say about the music, though, I think um, it, it kind of reminded me of what you were saying. Um, a, a guest, our guest last time uh, on a previous episode, Jose, uh, said something about um, something I really liked about how the the post-punk uh revival or whatever you want to say, the music today yeah, yeah. is um, really completely different different from the post-punk of the 80s if if you want like it's not public image limited or the meekins or even joy division or cabaret voltaire but it's experienced as this like continuation of a lineage and this Mm -hmm. this sort of Mm -hmm. looking back with fondness and reverence um and uh in some cases kind of like what you were saying about this uh, reaction to uh, uh, people on Instagram or that kind of thing, TikTok even, uh, uh, f- uh, the way it's being handled now, this sort of fear or resentment or anger uh, or feeling like people are are being boxed in. Maybe some people can feel like that or uh, these perceived misunderstandings of the way the music they grew up with is being treated. Mm. And uh, I feel like that kind of speaks to the going back to what we were talking about before or what i was talking about before that that um the um the like the the metaphysical nature of um humanity being uh um like continually becoming this this constant bringing forth of the self and uh i i could probably bring that back to the conversation about horror as well that experience of or gothic horror the 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 modern finding its distinct voice while while still shackled to or maybe not shackled but in conversation with the past for better right. or worse um like the ghosts of the gothic novel right who who return to the present uh, to haunt the present um and i think you you would find people on the scene today who who would see the kind of see the specters of the past now coming to um reconcile transgressions of the past or maybe wreck havoc on modern goths and so that that constant like negotiation or or conversation um with uh goth of the present and the past um is interesting and i think it's it's more explicit with goth culture where at least people that I talk to are goths are having this kind of conversation about canon and lineage and 
and historicity and uh, mm, mm-hmm. uh, the reciprocal nature of 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 goth identity and um, uh, musical genre and culture and um, um, past and present. And so um, um, I think that's kind of reflected in this idea of like um, the the post punk revival, which is really its own thing, but is experienced as oh, it's it's just part of this uh, continuation of something. But anyway, sorry, I went off on a tangent. Yeah, no, no, I <laughs> man, I, I love the way you talk about things. I, I've forgotten your um, the eloquence you bring to <laughs> to these subjects, which is is so cool. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think you know so much of like what gothic culture has always been um obsessed with is you know uh, the idea of nostalgia you know and you know you saw in the uh in the 70s when when goth started a lot of those those really early bands they were nostalgic for um a different time in era mm-hmm. and you know in the um the in, in in the in the eighties, you know, I think it was the same way, maybe a little bit different, you know. And now we're sort of nostalgic for for that era too. Uh, yeah, although yeah. I think we're in an interesting spot where we're nostalgic about everything, um, yeah, anything and everything, you know, like uh, because we were so disenchanted with our like waking reality, right? Um, yeah. And so, you know, um, you end up getting weird subcultures like um, Cottagecore and yeah. uh, the uh, Vaporwave stuff, you know. Dark academia. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the Cottagecore thing is really interesting to me because it, it kind of, there's a lot of complexity um, to, uh, you know, why would you want to embody this kind of idyllic 19, Mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, almost like Edwardian or Mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, post-Victorian England countryside aesthetic. Like I love it, but what that says a lot about like where we are right now that, you know, that's, there's a section of us that are completely and utterly absorbed with that, you know? Um, and I, yeah, Yeah. I know I was endlessly, fascinating and um you know but i do feel like you know um there's a lot of artists out there and especially in the music genre and i i think leah uh lane and you know rose garden they mm-hmm. they're kind of in this as well is that they there's there's new perspectives being put on these these things you know i felt like a lot of the 80s goth was kind of like very dystopian Mm. in you know kind of like definitely affected by the cold war and this feeling like i think sisters of mercy like especially the first album gives me this vibe of um you know riding a uh a a diesel vehicle through like a nuclear wasteland (laughs) um and like was it run around in the radiation you know Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um you know and and that's kind of like not what we're talking about right now because i think yeah. we we they were saying like we're afraid of this dystopia and we're like we've been through the dystopia and we're on the other side or you know or we're gonna live with the dystopia now so what what do we say now yeah. about, about this you know that's all i think that's cool you know there's this conversation that is continuing to to happen um, that for whatever reason there's something special i think about you know i think it's probably the literary element of of goth culture that uh, allows it to kind of re- uh, reflect on all these things, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm reining myself in because I know we're going <laughs> to, I have to put my kid to bed and I'm like, I, I, we can, I, I, how far am I going to push this? I think I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, so, cool, cool. so, so this really has been lovely though, Timothy. So I'm going to, I, I want to thank you for coming on. But again, I want to mention that, um, the documentary is called Dark Sanctuary, The Story of the Church. You can find the fundraising project on Indiegogo. So you can, there's a few ways to do that. You can go to the website, which is darksanctuarythemovie.com. And there is a link to the Indiegogo page from there. Uh, you can go to uh, the Indiegogo itself and search for Dark Sanctuary, The Story of the Church. 
uh, or you can scroll down in the show notes of this podcast, whether you're on YouTube or in a podcast app or however you're listening to this, and there will be a link um, to the Indiegogo page where you can go support them to get a reward uh copies of the movie and all kinds of other things and also get uh help them fund the movie so they can uh, make the documentary and uh bless us with uh this wonderful project so timothy th anything else you want to add no no I, I think that's great yeah thank you i mean i i think it's good to mention like you know indiegogo is not like gofundme um and it's not even like mm. kickstarter really it's more similar to kickstarter but um you know, we we no matter if we meet our goal of seventy thousand or not, we will get some portion of of the money, which is different than Kickstarter, where like you have to meet the goal or you don't get any of it, which is uh, a dangerous game. <laughs> but yeah. uh, uh, but what's different than GoFundMe is that you know, whereas GoFundMe is truly a donation um, on Indiegogo, we give you stuff in return mm -hmm. so as you said copies of the movie invite to online screenings uh vip parties we're giving away uh actual ceiling tiles from the church very cool which is cool there's limited number of those and um they are dfw pickup only because mm -hmm. they're big and fragile but um you know some other things like 45 rpm records with uh the th oh and i forgot to mention this shit i can't go away without saying this so um our title track for the uh you know like the title sequence music is going to be an original song probably titled something like dark sanctuary it's going to be co-composed with joe virus you know who is the mm -hmm. uh our protagonist and also the uh main stage dj um co-composed with uh kevin key of skinny puppy oh yeah that's right yeah, yeah. i forgot to mention that too yeah. um which is really fucking cool um and uh, that track will be pressed on for a certain donation level will be pressed onto 45 rpm records um on the a side and then on the b side will be a uh um a rare recording of a, uh, a pretty old, like I would say like early, late eighties, early nineties. Um, I guess it would probably be early nineties. Um, B side record from Joe's uh, music project, solemn assembly. Um, oh, that's super cool. Yeah. So um, I'm going to, we haven't decided what that track will be, but I'm going to like, say like, what haven't we heard Joe? Mm, let's mm -hmm, put that on there mm -hmm. um so that's going to be really cool so that's actually and a fair number of people has actually already donated at that level which i'm really happy about because that's going to be probably the coolest thing um yeah and i i'm gonna yeah. like have to like keep several copies <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for yeah myself. definitely yeah, so yeah. uh but you know like i said you know you you help us with the project but you also get a lot of cool stuff in return and um and I think that's important, you know, where uh, it's our way of saying thank you for uh, for the help, because it's a, you know, mm -hmm. it's a hard game making indie films. It's even harder to do indie documentaries because they take so damn long. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. But awesome. cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, thank you, you know, for having me on here. Uh, when I heard your um, your episode uh, with Patrick on the big seance, I was like, oh, shit, I need to be on this podcast. Oh, my God. That you, was you speak so my language long ago now. Yeah, I can't believe that was. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you liked it. That was like five, four or five years ago. Anyway, uh, it was yeah, good. Timothy, thank you so much for coming on. This was uh, a ton of fun. Thank you so much. for Yes. Sharing. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Album review. We're doing the album review. So this month we are reviewing the newest album from Night Sins, and this album is called Violet Age. So just a brief blurb about the band from their Facebook page. If you haven't heard of them, this is their own description. Night Sins is oral proof this side of the Atlantic that life does not walk so dark all over Europe alone. Emerging sometime around 2010 under the oppressive skies of Philadelphia, 
these overcast malcontents are fitly connected to a city engrossed in shadow-soaked vices and dilapidated architecture. Not to imply that there isn't a comforting sort of gloominess in this musical malaise, as night sins frolic down the musical path originally cut by the Sisters of Mercy and Clan of Zymox, with enough hints of the mission and extensions into 80s Darkwave to produce memorable songwriting that stands on its own. Bass and drums punch through the mist thick as thieves, guitar lines circle like falcons overhead, minimal synths street clean some of the residual dirt, and singer-songwriter Kyle Kimball's vocals confidently press into the intimate fog. There is a brilliant light in the midst of dimness, and Night Sins is carrying the torch. Uh, appropriately uh, dramatic description is, of the that band. That is quite the dramatic <laughs> description of the band. So let's play a track off the album. Um, I actually forgot to think of what track to play. Um, so let me take a look here. I don't have a strong opinion. Maybe let's go. Yeah, let's go with Turn to Gold.
So I will share my thoughts on the album here. I usually have less to say, so can't get it out of the way. <laughs> Um, so I was excited to review this because it's actually been quite a while since I've listened to Night Sins. I almost kind of forgot they existed. Uh, my last memory really of the band was, uh, someone playing Dancing Chrome on vinyl probably th th almost four years ago at a house party. Um, and that was the last album I was really into and probably, I, well, I'll talk about this towards the end of the review, but, uh, that was the album that I really listened to a lot and the one I was most familiar with. I wasn't, and am not familiar with most of their other discography. So I was, when I saw this album came out, I was excited to check it out because I haven't kept up with them for such a long time. And immediately, the album lets you know where it's headed. Uh, it starts off with this retro audio sample and this great 80s synth line. And likewise, the rest of the album has a killer retro vibe. Uh, you can also see that reflected in the cover as well, which I don't, I don't know what you'd call that art style. It's not quite synth wave, kind of synth wave. It more reminds me of the, um, the, the Kung Fury vector art retro eighties kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's kind of what they're going for They're The first track has, and I, it's mostly just the first track. I was less thrilled about the guitar that's on that song. I feel like it slowed down some of the songs on the album uh a little too much for me took away some of the punchiness and impact that i felt like they were going to have but the the first track is followed up by a couple tracks that for me at least do have the impact and speed that i was looking for uh they they don't go really like full 80s throwback it's not as much akin to a band like High Functioning Flesh, which uh, was kind of what I was expecting going into the album initially, or even like uh, Cabaret Voltaire. Uh, so um, on my first listen, I kind of had to adjust my expectations. So I wasn't getting whiplash, I guess, because I was, I was kind of expecting this uh, super indulgent nostalgia trip. Mm -hmm. But you get a lot of touches of more modern sensibilities, and they don't clash with each other. But uh, on the ver my very first listen, I, I was expecting a song to go one way, and it would kind of swing another way. So it was, it was a little, uh, you know, it was just my own projection of what I thought was going to happen. Uh, that said, though, uh, the track we did play, Turn to Gold, that was an example of a track where everything for me meshed together in kind of the way I would expect. It's also later on in the album, so I'm, I, on my first listen, I had kind of adjusted to what was going on. But it's this really kind of indulgent and melodic track. Uh, it's really atmospheric, and the vocals are dreamy and dynamic, and it has this, this the, the music itself has a dreamlike quality to it. And, uh, but some, and the synth lines are just so fucking sick. Like, uh, uh, Corium, uh, is just, I, I, mm, mm, I love it. Um, uh, the, the, the drum machine and the synth are just disgusting. It's so good. Uh, 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 I want, I want to <laughs> pack it up my ass and let it oscillate my G spot. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's delicious. Um, Moonlight Czar is another track that I really liked. Uh, Melody-wise, it was fairly simple, but they totally ditched the guitar there, and it was more reminiscent of a cyberpunk track than an 80s retro wave song, which is maybe a subjective uh, delineation, but that's what it reminded, that's the vibe it gave me. 
So it was it was it was more dancey uh, than some of the other tracks on the album. I felt, and in that way, I I felt like it kept the album fresh, um, and kind of in a similar way to the song "Seasick," which was another track that, for me at least, bent the expectations of the album in a different way. So. Um, having listened to this a few times and thinking about and then going back to and listening to dancing chrome uh which really fits that album itself fits more into the uh post-punk kind of twin tribe side of the scene with the jangly guitars and deep yeah deep deeper reverbed eldritch vocals um, which were really kind of almost completely missing on this album. Uh, you you still obviously on on Dancing Chrome get some of that '80s new wave synth synth wave kind of synth sprinkled in, but it's always in service to a darker, more goth sound. Um, and I'm not really familiar enough with the corpus of their work to say where those two albums fit within the rest of their discography. Um, I, I did some skimming through the rest of their discography I, uh, to kind of refresh because I have listened to their albums. I just like it was really Dancing Chrome that was on something that was on repeat a lot, um, whereas the rest were more cursory listens. Um, so I kind of had this idea in my head that the albums previous to Dancing Chrome were almost like a version of Terminal Gods, but with synth. Um, so the this album, uh, uh, Violet Age, is definitely a different direction and almost a different mm. band, but okay. um, uh, which isn't bad. It's just different. Uh, so, but as this, this album is concerned, um, I really enjoyed it. I, I had a lot of fun with it. You know, I really do like that vibe and aesthetic and, uh, that this album elicits and they do both of those really, really well. Uh, the dancing Chrome sound and the violet age sound. And I think their albums are these, those two albums specifically are kind of in my view, sort of like up there with bands that really are at the top of their craft and, and are doing that uh, version of that genre within goth um, that, that's really well produced and uh, crafted. Um, so I, I really dig it. There are maybe a couple things that I, like I mentioned with the guitar and stuff that I wasn't uh, into as much. But uh, yeah, I would give this a uh, four out of five. So definitely worth your time. All right. Very nice. Um, so for me, this is the first time I've knowingly listened to Night Sins. I, I'm not necessarily mm -hmm. familiar with the band, though it's a very good chance that I've heard them played at a club somewhere at some time because I go to enough clubs where I just don't know all the music that gets played. So it's possible I've heard some stuff by them before. Mm -hmm. But for me, this is my first exposure to the band i don't have any any weight of memories of other albums or anything to compare to so i definitely can't go into any depth on whether this is an evolution of sound or new sound or, or how it relates at all to the rest of their their body of work uh, i also didn't really go and listen to any of the other stuff though i will definitely check out the uh the dancing chrome album because that does sound interesting it actually sounds more interesting than this one was to me mm. Um, so I'm interested to hear what that one was like. So as far as this album was was concerned, I guess, I kind of almost sum it up as Peter Steele fronting a synth pop band. <laughs> that is the uh, huge vibe I got from it for much of the, the album, though it wasn't just Peter Steele. It would be like the sort of split personality of Peter Steele for the, the richer vocals. But then the slower and when he gets slower and more quieter and whispery, it gave me a very Trent Reznor uh, ballad mm. vibe when Trent Reznor does some of his slower stuff, especially off of like Pretty Hate Machine. 
um, when he gets kind of whispery in there, right up against the mic rather than screaming. Um, it kind of bounced back and forth between those two vibes for me, which I found really interesting at first. And I really, I mean, these are all bands that I really enjoy. Uh, so I did find it really interesting. But the problem I had with it is as I was listening to it, most of the tracks just gave me this weird sense of deja vu, mm. which isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing in general. But for those who have listened to me give reviews in the past, know that that's kind of a bad thing to me. I don't really like music that reminds me of other music so much. I want music mm-hmm. that, that sparks this idea that, oh, this is something new and different. So I kind of was turned off because of that. Um, a lot of the tracks felt like sort of versions of other tracks, some more egregiously than others in my mind. Um, but, but yeah, I definitely had that, that sort of typo negative meets synth pop uh, vibe, not in the... I guess the musical style, there wasn't really any metal to it at all. So it wasn't yeah. musically typo negative, but the singing style, especially with the very, the very deep voice, which you, know, you mentioned the Eldritch baritone, Dredge and Reverb thing. And they'd have, they have one song that I thought was very, uh, actually it was the second song, Kill Like I Do. Hmm. That felt to me like, basically a synth pop sisters of mercy early sisters of mercy like first last and always era i was hearing things like alice and amphetamine logic in that but with more of a synth pop vibe to it like a synth pop cover of those songs was kind of what that gave me and that was an instance where the singer did sort of evoke that andrew eldridge vibe but other than that it had that sort of very slow onset you know starting with sort of a fry vocal to, and, uh, and sort of thing that was very Peter Steely to me, um, especially off of uh, their second album, uh, mm-hmm. which is the main one I that I know for uh, typo negative that got me into the band. Um, so that, that's really I got more of that uh, vibe. Um, as far as the instrumentation of music, it I mean the the band was well crafted. I don't have any technical quibbles about the band. They did, like I said, have some very good synth work. Um, it really dug into that whole synth pop vibe that's been so big over the last probably five-ish, maybe 10 years um, that's been coming through. And they really did lean into that well. And I, I enjoy synth pop quite a lot. But like I said, my main issue is while they were doing synth pop really well, the vocalist was really good really just gave me this vibe of synth pop covers of other songs that I know, um, mm. which amused me and I enjoyed, but didn't really grab me and make me go, Ooh, this is really something that excites me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it definitely, it interests me. And if you like synth pop um, and you like things that, you know, kind of remind you of, of other things you may love. Cause I mean, I was getting, Depeche Mode vibes. I was getting Sisters of Mercy vibes. I was getting Eurythmics vibes, um, Nine Inch Nails vibes. Um, it's actually kind of funny. The uh, Corium one that you mentioned, Just Loving, mm-hmm. that felt so much to me like Nine Inch Nails from Purest Feeling, which is a sort of an unreleased bootleg of the demo versions for Pretty Hate Machine, where Trent was still coming out of the sort of, because he was in a keyboardist for an 80s synth pop band uh, before starting Nine Inch Nails. And right. that demo yeah. were still, you could definitely hear the synth pop side of him before he went yeah. into the more sort of um, modern industrial or the 90s industrial uh, production that yeah. he sort of almost, I guess, pioneered uh, yeah. as far as that specific sound. So yeah, I, I don't thought think that, I can. I, I... I knew that I don't think I can um, visualize or, or hear the, the music in my, in my brain to make the comparison, but yeah, that's, a, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you, you might be actually interested to hear that. I know you're not a huge Nine Inch Nails fan. Um, I, I've heard it before. I just can't like recall what it sounded like. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I thought Corium really was basically just, it felt like a Nine Inch Nails, it felt like it could have been a Nine Inch Nails song off of that album. It didn't feel like any of the specific songs per se. Mm. Um, I mean, I guess I kind of felt like Head Like a Hole, but Head Like a Hole wasn't on the demo track, even though that was on 
pretty hate machine. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't part of the purest feeling demo track. So it, well, the, I guess the drum beat kind of reminded me of that a little bit, but the synth lines were, were a different feel, uh, almost like a ring finger kind of feel with the, the steady pulse happening, uh, which is on purest feeling. So that I found that kind of interesting that that uh, really reminded me of that. And then I guess the one that, I don't know if it really, it kind of bothered me the most was the last track. And I didn't realize how much it made sense with the title because I wasn't even listening to the title. To listen to this, this was the first time listening through it. I was in the car, just playing through the album, not paying attention to what the titles were because I was driving. Um, and the last track came on, and the piano line felt like a reworking of basically the main synth riff from "Sweet Dreams Are Made of This" by the Arrhythmics. Um, but the voice was doing the sort of Nine Inch Nails whispery vocals. So it was like the Arrhythmics Nine Inch Nails mashup, um, which I found amusing, but also kind of distracting as I was listening to it because the, the piano line has the exact same rhythm as it from Sweet Dreams, but different notes. Um, but it was close enough that it just it made me think of that every time it played through. Um, and then the, the lyrics would come in, like at the same point, the lyrics would come in compared to the synth line. They were talking about different things, though. When I looked at the lyrics, I'm like, they're both about sleep and dreaming. Interesting. So I thought that was kind of amusing, but it was just very distracting when I was listening to mm -hmm. it, that they were playing. I don't know. It just, there's a lot of things about this album that just were poking my buttons a little bit. Um, so I can't say there's anything bad about it specifically, but it just didn't grab me. So I would That's give it fair enough. probably about a two and a half out of five yeah. for me. Um, not a bad album by any stretch of the imagination. Musically very good. The vocalist was great. The vocalist was doing the things that I like, which is not being the same voice all the way through. It was inhabiting the different songs with a vocal presence that fit with the theme of the song that they were getting to. Um, the lyrics were good. I wasn't really listening to them that deeply, but there weren't any you know, overtly cheesy lyrics or forced rhythmic or rhyming schemes. Everything was, was solid. Um, the lyrics that I caught were, were good, had some good use of imagery and metaphor, and I enjoyed it overall from that aspect. It was just this weird constant sense of deja vu that kept taking mm -hmm. me out of it and just annoying me that little bit. But yeah. that's a me thing. That's not no, that's fair enough, something that... that everybody will always agree with that is just what bugged me about it so i mean if you like synth pop definitely check them out um and if you like something it would harken back and and make you reminisce about sisters or depeche mode or early early nine inch nails then awesome great if you'd like to see those bands kind of mashed up with the vocal style of a uh, typo negative and the uh, the synth pop style of depeche mode in the same song this is your this is your album, um, so so yeah, that's kind of my take on it. It's also interesting how different. Well, maybe not how different we are, but how different uh, or how uh, diverse the genre of synth pop is. Because my first, when I think of synth pop, my brain goes to bands like uh, Nam Nam Bulu, Solitary Experiments. Uh, Pride and Fall, Seabound, um, like Ashbury Heights, um, Minerve, uh, which I don't think sound Frozen Plasma, like bands that I don't think sound anything like this album. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but then the bands you were talking about, I think, are are like in the ballpark, like fair comparisons. Which is why when I was talking about uh, genre compar comparisons, I was more use saying, you know, like these retro 80s synth kind of things. Because, mm -hmm. But I think synth pop is such a broad 
genre classification that all of those bands kind of fit under that. Because I guess you could also say future pop, but future pop, I think of diff- a different, uh, a different sound than to the bands that I named. But that's also those two genres kind of bleed into each other as well. It's kind of like the EBM thing for a while, where it's like now they divide between old school EBM and EBM. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just kind of a yeah, I guess my attitude towards synth pop, I mean, it is broad because it's basically pop music with synths as right, the yeah. driving musical <laughs> yeah. element. And yeah. all of the bands you named were, I guess, I mean, I don't necessarily know a lot of them, but they all felt more, too modern for what I consider synth pop, which is, in my mind, the late 70s, early 80s mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, branch of New Wave. So I'm thinking, again, like Depeche Mode, I'm thinking yeah. New Order, I'm thinking Falco. Um, things like that, you know, definitely those sort of core right. 80s bands that were in there with New Wave, but unlike New Wave, which has some guitars, um, synth pop is the stuff that's basically all synth, you know, yeah, like Gary Newman and, and the like. So that's sort of my touchstone when it comes to synth pop, um, which is, of course, distinct from synth wave, even though synth wave isn't really a synth pop revival. And I consider this to be sort of a a mix but definitely more on the synth pop lines because it's not doing the cinematic side that synth wave tends to do mm-hmm. where it's synth wave is more gravitating towards the movie soundtracks of the 80s your blade runners and um and the like labyrinth yeah, yeah. um that sort of cinematic synth side um is where synth wave is really drawing from and not the poppy synth side of uh of synth pop that i can think of from the you know late 70s early 80s mm-hmm. so yeah. i guess that's that's kind of where i come from when i when i quit it with synth pop but yeah no it makes sense yeah overall i think it's a good album and people should check it out despite my you know relatively negative review though it's not below halfway point um no i mean it's i think that makes for an interesting segment a more interesting segment and uh you know a more interesting review and even even if we're our reviews are always <laughs> pretty high ratings because you know i'm i'm picking albums that i think are interesting and that i like so yeah we're not throwing and, darts at a dartboard right. and just picking a random album that could be total garbage yeah um and i also generally tend to not want to spend a lot of time like shitting on an album yeah. uh even though that can be fun i also know there's people behind it that like so even if it's something that i don't like i try to be positive about it but mm-hmm. um i think you know it can even if we're reviewing albums and we're saying oh this is great i'm sure there's a not insignificant portion of people that go listen to the album and are like eh, no i don't like this not for me so whether we like it or not, uh, I think go check it out anyway and make your own decision. You know, it's as we always say, uh, this kind of thing is subjective and you're going to, you know, have your own views on it. So we say do your own research. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I think so. All right. No, uh, I just, yeah, I'm just sort of the same way. I don't like talking negatively about an album. So when I approach an album like this, that I just didn't, it didn't grab me. I try to find those things that I can talk well about it. And, and I try to, as is very apparent, give all the caveats in the world that this is my opinion. It's not a reflection of the quality of the album itself. I can see the craft in the album. And I will try to speak to the craft of the album, even if for whatever reason, it just pushes my buttons or something like this one did. And mm-hmm. it made me not as interested in it as I might otherwise be, despite having a lot. It has a lot of the ingredients of things that I do like. Yeah, yeah. All right, that means it's time for sinister suggestion. So you got to be interested in death. It's the last great taboo. It's the only taboo left. Precisely. I mean, why is it? Do you think that everyone in here is dressed in black? It's a celebration of death. No, I just like the clothes. Mm. Yeah, well, no. I mean, <laughs> the clothes look good. Yeah, I mean, death looks good. Charles Manson, yeah? No, he was cool. Mm. Mm. 
don't know if I mentioned it before, but I'm actually a vampire. <laughs> sinister suggestion. So my sinister suggestion is a movie that has essentially nothing to do with goth whatsoever, except for maybe some sort of existential dread aspects of it. Relatively popular, though, I think it, it, it's a bit of an indie movie that I think fell under a lot of people's radars. So it's very highly rated on like Rotten Tomatoes. Um, but it's the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. Oh, yes. With Michelle Yeoh. Everyone keeps tell, you know, talking about how incredible this film is, and I haven't seen it yet, but I think it's streaming now. So please well, tell me all about it. I'm going to give you a very it. big reason to see it, because there's one scene that was basically custom designed for you. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, right. I don't know what your attitude is towards like martial arts type movies. Uh, I'm into it. I'm not it. really I'm keying it. on that side of things. But if you're into martial arts movies, this this one scene, which I'll go over a little bit later, which isn't a spoiler scene necessarily. It's just it's it's a scene in the movie that is directly designed. It's it's pointed at Danny Ashes. Like nothing okay. else in this world is pointed at Danny Ashes. <laughs> well, I I mean I've heard in in general that it's kind of a like if ADHD was a movie. Yes, it's very so much it's that. Already that's sounds like something I'd from. be interested in, okay. but. The movie for like 70 to 80% of its runtime is a completely bizarre acid trip multiverse mind fuck. Okay. Um, All right. I mean, it starts pretty banal and you're just in a world, but then you start seeing this aspect that they're, they're going through a multiverse thing is, you know, that's sort of the thing with all these movies exploring the multiverses. Um, but this one is doing that in that, you know, we live in a, a universe where everything could have happened and there are these parallel universes and some people can either travel between them by inhabiting people from the other universe. So it's not like teleporting. It's actually more if you've seen the latest Doctor Strange movie, um, how Scarlet Witch goes by inhabiting, her, like possessing a body of her own alternate in another universe is how she right. can travel yes we rather did, than we did go see that movie okay yeah. so rather than physically traveling um like i forget her name does the the main girl oh uh, scarlet uh, witch no 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 the hero that uh oh that strange uh, is protecting um, america yeah yeah america i should know that it's got a big star on her but <laughs> so she can physically travel between the realms and take people with her Scarlet Witch can't. She has to use a ritual that puts her consciousness into possessing someone in the other realm. So in this movie, the idea of traveling through the multiverse is more akin to that possession aspect. Mm -hmm. But there are some people who can physically go, but for the most part, it's accessing abilities from those other alternate universes. So some people who in one multiverse, which discovered the idea of the multiverse and discovered how to Utilize it has figured out that by performing certain actions specific to each person, they're able to kind of break through those barriers a little bit and access the skill set of someone from a parallel multiverse. Mm. So, you know, if they're an amazing chef, you can do fancy knife tricks. If they're a martial artist, you can fight, um, that sort of thing. But you have to do something specific to you, some act specific to you to unlock your potential to kind of go into this trance state and unlock those powers and then temporarily use them until you get brought out of that trance state sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of how this first, and it's very confusing throughout most of it. There's very little explanation, just throws you right into this very banal life situation, but then suddenly it explodes into this multiverse where all these weird possibilities are occurring. Um, and you're seeing this person who started in this sort of been all life uh, reacting to, and she happens to be the one who's sort of been glommed onto as a chosen person who has the ability to more effectively embody all these other universes to be a counterpoint to the big evil person who has, who also has that ability to embody so much that they just can control they can control possibilities and make just random things happen in whatever world they happen to inhabit. So they're kind of as a, as a battle, this unwitting hero who is supposedly the perfect foil to this villain. Um, and so it's just crazy and bizarre and ridiculous throughout most of the movie. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. but then it evolves into this sort of emotional family drama. There's a lot of heart. There's a lot of the struggles that this initial family are going through Mm -hmm. are brought to a head and they are, they're shown to have been driving factors in the, the creation of this whole conflict. Mm -hmm. So it all loops around. There's relationships that are exposed through various versions of the characters that led to this conflict. Um, And that, sort of allows the movie towards the latter quarter or so to congeal around something that's very, very emotionally powerful. And the movie starts to really take you into this space where one second you're sobbing because of this very powerful emotional moment. Mm -hmm. And the next uh, second you're on the floor laughing because something (laughs) just ridiculous happened. Interesting. Wow. So it's a fascinating head trip. It's really bizarre. Um, I could see the ADHD um in movie form being uh an aspect of it um it does deal a lot with existentialism in that the the villain is sort of succumbing to existential dread and hopelessness and the hero is trying to reverse that and trying to put meaning on what is being perceived as a meaningless existence Mm -hmm. um that's kind of the main driving conflict that evolves throughout uh, but back to the scene that was designed for Danny. <laughs> there are apparently two characters who unlock their powers by this a butt to do plug. With oh it my. does by a butt plug. <laughs> and so there's an entire fight scene where the hero yes. is realizes this and the person like lost their powers yes. and they drop their trowel. And they see there, there are all these actually vaguely butt plug shaped awards in this office building. <laughs> and they're trying to jump on to land butt first onto the butt plug to unlock their power. And so the other person oh is trying to push God. them away. Um, and that's one character. And then another character comes in just out of the blue and also has, I guess, the same power. My also God. drops trow. But unlike the first one who dropped trow to underwear, the second one drops trow to nothing. Though they have a longish shirt, so you can't see. Mm-hmm. They do land on a butt plug and proceed to fight with a butt plug hanging out of their ass. That is incredible. much of the fight, and it is that totally is designed for Danny Ashes. <laughs> that um, is amazing. <laughs> so that wow. is that made me think of it, and I just had to had to make it my sinister suggestion That's for hilarious. this show, even if it's a sinister suggestion, primarily for you. I love it. All right, I'll have to watch that then. But yeah, it's a trip. I definitely recommend it, and it's it's a really powerful message about family and understanding too when it all wraps up in the end Mm -hmm. well you know what then i'll just very 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 quickly briefly because i don't i don't have notes on this so i don't want to ramble on and have nothing to say uh and not be cogent in any way about this but since we did just do an interview about filmmaking and we talked about horror Uh, and you gave a movie suggestion, I'll give a very quick movie suggestion that was just released, and I just watched it, so it's uh, on the top of my mind. Uh, It's a a film called Mad God. It is a stop-motion movie uh, made by Phil Tippett, who you may know as a a special effects uh, person in Hollywood who worked, uh, he's famous for working on um, Jurassic Park, and star wars he did the like the um the checkerboard scene in uh that first star wars movie with the the um what's the word i'm looking for the holograph what i'm totally drawing a blank on the scene so i can't holograph it's there's like yeah there's a checkerboard on the millennium falcon and there's holograph um pieces and there's like a guy that grabs the other guy and like smashes the piece or whatever but he's done like a bunch Mm -hmm. of incredible special effects work in hollywood and so this is his movie that he's worked on on and off for like 30 years and it was just released it's been in at film festivals and stuff but it was just released now to be able to watch on streaming uh on shutter so if you don't have shutter you can get like a seven day free trial and watch it if you want uh it's a kind of a horror movie um it's not really a horror movie but it's this sort of surrealist um um almost kind of, you kind of going back to the acid trip thing there's a bit of that in there you follow the 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 storyline is 
just you follow this protagonist the protagonist is called the assassin i believe and they're on a mission which you you know it's not really clear what that is but you follow them through this kind of i wouldn't say it's a hellscape but it's this society this world and uh, there's no dialogue and um it's story is not clear it's not a narrative that is telegraphed to the viewer uh so it's primarily a vehicle for the artistry and the surrealism and the incredible uh character design and um um uh, stop motion animation and 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 you know i'm not technical into that kind of thing so i can't really describe how incredible that is uh but you know there it's left up to the viewer to kind of decipher it's one of those movies where it's like there is meaning there that you can bring to it and interpret it so like when i was watching it for me my viewing of this the first half read to me as a critique of capitalism and uh what that does to the working class and also a critique of of like the healthcare system and then the second half of the film read more as like a uh metaphor for um the creative process and the cycle of birthing ideas the birth and death of ideas and also the the just the life cycle of uh of life in general um mm -hmm. and how birth begets life and death begets birth um uh, and so it's it's uh it's a really fascinating film that is unsettling in a way that's it's not overly gore there is a scene that is kind of graphic but not overly graphic but it's just a really strange fascinating film that kind of fits i think with some of the themes we were talking about so there's another film suggestion before i get into my you know the music stuff cool yeah it sounds interesting i'll see if i can find a and access to that and, and take a look at it because it definitely sounds interesting i do like stop motion type stuff yeah it's it's really cool and it's one of those sort of like here is here's someone who is a master of what they do and here is their sort of swan song master class what's the what's the word for uh, magnum opus their sort of passion uh, project yeah pr passion project uh yeah it sounds like he wasn't going by somebody else's he wasn't trying to make somebody else's vision exactly happen. yeah he was free to cut loose and make his own vision with his own craft yeah um which is sometimes a mixed bag sometimes it's, uh, it's absolutely, amazing yeah. another time it's like oh yeah you really need a leash on that yeah to, to <laughs> yeah. make something coherent but it sounds like this is the former and is a is a, a powerful statement by a master as you said of his craft all right here we go so the first track for my sinister suggestions is a single called gothamist by the amaranth and this is an absolutely wild track uh as ken told me this in a tongue-in-cheek manner as the best goths do it's basically goth we are the world so this track was put out by amaranth which is ken's band who uh you should know from sounds and shadows which is also uh, a youtube channel and a blog that uh interviews goth and industrial artists among other things they do a fantastic job of that as well uh, Ken is super passionate about the scene, and you should definitely check them out. So this track is a smorgasbord of musicians. So the the artists on this single song are Jason of Actors, Jean Marc of The The, Gene Loves Jezebel, Fat Gadget, The Weathermen, uh, Dan Milligan of The Joy Thieves, and The Burying Kind. Kimberly of Bow Ever Down, which is, I mean, like, I didn't know. I thought I was the only one who knew about Bow Ever Down. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, Caddy of Caddy Needs a Life. 
Safira and Brian Grotner of the Gothicals and Gasoline and Vertebrate, Ryan Flint of Witch Hands, Matt of A Cloud of Ravens as well. I honestly don't know how they even made this track sound like music in the first place with all of those hands in the pot, but you get this gorgeous, velvety, almost 70s rock sounding chill vibes to study to track. It's honestly hard to describe musically, at least for me, but conceptually, the notion of collaborating with all these artists to showcase and bring together the artistic prowess of the modern goth scene is definitely something I can get behind. So, uh, well done. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the album. Such a crazy concept. Uh, definitely worth checking out just on the basis of the concept alone. The next is from the band Echo the Strange and the album is called Mystique. This album I'd say is kind of a mix of the Frozen Autumn and Pawns which is kind of a wet dream for me. This Polish band produces a stripped down, echoey, post-punk blended with cold wave. You get this deep reverbed vocal, but also instrumental tracks that feel built purely for ambience and goths sure do love their ambience. Uh, The synth is pretty haunting and um, the album as a whole has some pretty great atmospheric. Next up is Velos Invisibles by Molt. This Costa Rican band is definitely taking inspiration from bands like Joy Division and Lebanon Hanover. It's got this bleak, lo-fi, large room echo, post-punk sound that just bleeds sadness and longing. The cover art is reminiscent of, uh, going back to the previous album, the Eastern European post-punk we've seen a lot of. And you definitely hear that influence on this EP as well. This album is dancier than this band's previous album. Uh, Their previous album only had two tracks on there that were kind of dancey and we're in the vein of like Rendezvous, for example, and the rest of them were like Sad Bastard songs, does the inverse where most of the tracks are on the dancey side and um, there's a couple slower songs. Strangely though, the, the production sounds, at least to my ear, a little bit worse than their previous album. Uh, the sound, the music sounds a little more muffled and distant. Um, So personally, I preferred their previous album, which is called Pasado Inconsciente. Um, But I still like this album and uh, thought it was worth recommending. Next up, on the other hand of the fidelity spectrum, we have the new album from the Roman band This Eternal Decay. And the album is called Nocturne. It's an interesting album that goes from more sweeping, grand, dark wave tracks to songs more reminiscent of Icon of Coil or Assemblage 23. The vocals are always full of passion, sometimes tortured. Uh, Most tracks are synth heavy, but other tracks let the guitar and drums take over. And really the album is quite varied, both musically and in the lyrical content. If you're someone who craves diversity in your albums, you should keep this uh, in the back of your mind because I think it will keep you engaged and bobbing along from track to track. Next is the album by Fawns of Love called Innocence of Protection. We're going back to last year now. Obviously, uh, because that's when this came out, 
Now, obviously no one can be Cocteau Twins, but I get big Cocteau Twin vibes off this Shoegaze album. But it's generally more upbeat. You know, it reminds me a lot of Key Lime Pie. Uh, if you're a fan of Key Lime Pie, of course. Um, that's probably a super weird thing to say, but you get these lush, gorgeous uh, mezzo-soprano or lyric soprano vocals over this misty, dreamlike staccato synth with occasional post-punk guitar that just floats in and out of the tracks um, here and there. And it, again, it just feels kind of like a dream. It's all so light and airy, a lot like Key Lime Pie. <laughs> I'm so sorry for this terrible metaphor. Uh, it's an album that kind of happens to you. As timid as it may seem, it really kind of demands attention, requires you to join in its revelry in a land far away. Closed Circuits is the new track from Totenwald, which is out on their part-time punks release, which is a set of live recordings. The new track doesn't do anything unexpected. You've got the fairly simplistic punk style drum beat, syncopated guitar that feels a bit disjointed from everything else, sexy sax, and smooth raspy vocals decrying government surveillance. It's a bit more subdued than their previous songs. Not my favorite outing from them, but I do love the band, so I'm always glad to have new music. Uh, after that, we've got the newest single from Italian band I Am No One called The Need. To me, this band is reminiscent of early 2000s Dark Wave. It's pared down with a heavier focus on melody and romanticism. The vocals are muted and further back in the mix, and there's a similarity to some of the slower, more ballad-like synth-pop stuff that bands like uh, Blue Dangle or Solitary Experiments put out. So if that sounds interesting, you should check this out. These two tracks are more in that vein than some of their previous work, and I really love them for that very specific reason. Uh, but if you're looking for dark wave that's just slightly off kilter from what you might expect in the modern scene, then this might do it for you. Then we've got uh, another Italian band, and it's awfully funky. Uh, it is Clone Culture with their new track, Floating. Uh, the bass in this track is the star of the show, even though it's further back in the mix. It's definitely making love to the synth and the guitar that are doing their best mid-80s pop-punk impression in an unholy menage a trois layered in Depeche Mode-esque vocals. I don't want to call it cheesy 80s, but I don't have a much better reference point personally. You'll kind of recognize it when you hear it. Uh, it, it more visually brings to mind those blue and purple 80s graphics that are basically just geometric shapes. Like, if that was a song, it would be this song, and it's fantastic. Next up is the six-track EP from the Isle of Man band Marky Moon, and what a banger it is. This is a great blend of driving gothic rock that's moody and grand with these almost western gothic sounding vocals that uh, kind of remind me of Nick's vocal in The Birthday Party, but more refined and haunting or um, actually almost even kind of like the vocalist from The Dust of Basement for anyone who remembers that band. Or actually, you know, um, uh, the vocalist from Informatic is actually probably a much better comparison now that I'm thinking about it. But the, the vocalist also hits some higher notes occasionally, that, uh, and there's a, a female vocal mixed in as well that's really lovely and haunting in its own way. It's uh, blending with uh, post-punk gives, uh, gives the music a grounding, keeping it from being more akin to the kind of arena rock tracks of Sisters of Mercy. Um, so the the band sounds more similar to uh, like a sister's track like Nine Wall Nine, which is one of my favorite tracks. Um, but incredible EP, I highly recommend it. And then we've got uh, from Qu Quebec, Montreal, 
by Laura Krieg. The album is, or the EP is, V. Magike? Magike? I have no idea how to pronounce that. I'm so sorry. Um, the album is in French. There's a great use of minimalism. You've got this raw bass layered with a simple reverbed drum beat and this groovy synth bass line that grows into some occasional electronic distortions and and then you get these yips and zaps that come from the synth. The star though is the droning shouting vocals over the top that are very like Suzy reminiscent and kind of remind me of Malaria in a lot of ways. But this is a super super sexy, dancey, oblique sounding album. I get chills every time I listen to it. Definitely go check it out. And then finally, we've got the album Train to 86th Street by Camlan. Uh, and this is a band a duo from Indonesia. And as the cover implies, if you look at it, there's definitely some disco influence on this album, which is something you never really hear on any genre within goth. So right from the first track, you know this is going to be something different. For me, that's exciting and interesting because I'm having my expectations subverted, but it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but goddamn does it funk. Likewise, the vocal delivery is not similar to what I've heard. You get some spoken word bits and some sung bits, all with the tonality and timbre of the Indonesian accent, which adds a great quality to the vocal delivery. The album I felt was overall more polished and diverse and enjoyable than their previous album. Not that their previous album was bad, but they did improve on some aspects that I had an issue with. So definitely one to go check out and get your groove on to. And with that, we're going to wrap up this episode of Cemetery Confessions. Thank you all so much for spending your time with us this month. We'll be back again next month with Clint of the band Blood Bells. And we're going to be talking about a whole variety of subjects. We'll be talking about polyamory. We'll be talking about the concept of subculture and postmodernism. We might even be talking about the dumb shit that Faderhead said on Facebook. (laughs) So please come back, subscribe to us if you haven't, if you're on YouTube or Facebook or a podcast app like iTunes Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify or whatever you're using. Thank you to everyone on Patreon who supports us month after month. You are quite literally the only reason I have the capacity to continue to produce this show. It exists because of the generous people that support what we're doing here at Cemetery Confessions. So if you'd like to support us, if you'd like to get extra content, uh, access to the Discord server, merch, extra merch, uh, early access to episodes, access to bonus content, videos, interviews, that kind of stuff, head over to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. Thank you all so much again for being here with me. It truly is a pleasure. Thank you for spending your time. Until next time, stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information.